Okay, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you very much. And um, my first task is to thank Damien for pulling this together. Damien is a real mover and shaker within Park. Um, Park originated at South Bank. It was about seven years ago, six, seven years ago, when Damien was working as a researcher on a project about mentoring with autistic adults. And it became incredibly obvious that there are lots of autistic adults who are very capable of contributing to research as researchers and have not necessarily got access to that um, opportunity. And Park offers peer support, researcher development, and a genuine contribution to research. And although it started at South Bank, it's become something that is just going on all over the place, all over the UK and beyond. So Damien is a massive mover and shaker in Park. And none of, none of the Park participants are paid academics specifically in their park role. So much of this is done by volunteers and I think it's a real testament to the hard work of everybody involved that the park happens in the way it does. So this is just one of many, many park events that happens at South Bank and happens all over the place. We'll put the website in, in the in chat in a little while. I also want to thank um, Fabian Benoist, who coordinates the Critical Autism and Disability Studies Research Group, but she's not here today, she's unwell. And of course, Neil, because Neil is the fantastic events manager. So I don't think I want to say anything else because I want to sort of move on really quickly to the presentations and so on. And today we want to give plenty of time for discussion and um, comments in the chat and all that sort of thing. So I think that's all I've got to say, really. Damien, I don't know if there's anything else that you want to say. Um, just to, again, welcome everyone and really looking forward to seeing everyone's talks today. Um, it's got really good program, I think. So I think everyone will enjoy. So, uh, um, and just again to, say that we'll be holding um, another conference event in December um, and we're holding a workshop tomorrow evening which I think is probably near to booked out however there will be another online workshop um, in December as well as a conference day so lots happening um, so do look out on the park website for events coming up. Um, um, Neil's just put the date in the uh, <laughs> chat box. Thanks, Neil. 6th of December. And there'll be a workshop on Tuesday, the 7th of December as well. Um, so much to look forward to. Um, so... We've got a few minutes before our first presentation. Um, not sure we need to so say. Maybe, yeah, maybe we should pick out some of the comments that are there in the chat. Um, one thing that I've noticed is the park is truly international. We ha I don't know if you've, you were all seeing seeing this or looking at it, we've we got greetings from Malaysia, greetings from Hong Kong, greetings yeah. from Seoul, where else? Um, Hello everyone. <laughs> so we've got, we've, we've got, we've got trail, um, autistic um, uh, PhD student and uh, mum to autistic 10 year old son. I'm American, but beaming in from Dubai. Um, yeah. So we've got- Ireland from Scotland. Yep. Yeah. Um, we've got some more, we've got uh, LSBU students. Uh, we've got new, uh, we've got, um, uh, Sudan Hanshu, um, a late diagnosed autistic woman from um, from New Delhi in India. So, so lots of people joining this morning. Um, Nani, blogger on how our brains work and how to work with our brains. Um, that sounds super interesting. Please do pop the link to your blog um, in 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 the chat box. Um, Karen, a PhD student studying autistic inertia at the University of Manchester. Um, so lots coming through. Yeah. Um, this I'm just it's picking up Australia. here. <laughs> oh, Australia. Beth Hardy, I'm just picking this up. Somebody here who is interested, is a researcher in criminology, but at Cambridge, but interested in making links with autism research. Um, 
um, Professor Eddie Chaplin, who is one of our researchers at London South Bank University, is a very, very good contact for you. Um, Beth, I will put him in the chat. Just um, so uh, Cleo Cosburn would be worth looking up in some of the chapters and articles she's written on criminal justice issues. Um, yeah, and also Luke Bearden, who's a visiting fellow yeah. in our research centre, and Richard Mills, of course, who's one of our um, supporters of, of one of our funded projects. So there's all sorts, this networking stuff is really an important aspect of this conference. And feel free to use the chat during the day to, uh, to, dis to discuss the topics as we go through them, because there's plenty to talk about today with the topics that will be coming up as well. Okay, and I'm um, going to sorry. I'll just on. say that a uh, change to the program um, for those just joining us that uh, Susie Bass was unable to come today and had to cancel. So we're going to try and move her into uh, the December conference that we're holding on 6th of December. So Nikki Martin will be taking that spot to be talking about projects at South Bank University. Um, but we'll be keeping the general structure of the morning the same. Um, so we'll be having the Q&A session for the first two presentations after the first two talks with Nicola and Chrystia together. Um, hi, Chrystia. Uh, and uh, um, but if you have questions that come up during Chris's talk, do drop them in the Q&A in the chat box um, so that we can have a look at those before we get to the Q&A and have a good think about them. So, um, so uh, are you able to share your slides, Chris? I am indeed, if you bear with me. I'll hand over to you. Bear with me, everyone, while I make them full screen because I've got the Zoom bar in the way. Okay. Fantastic. So thank you, Damien, for introducing me. My name is Krisha Waldock. I am a fourth year part time PhD student at the University of Kent. I'm in the same department as Damien at the Tizard Centre. And today I'm going to be presenting on one of my studies, which has the working title, Conceptualising Belonging, the Views of Autistic People. And a bit of background on me, as I've said, I'm a fourth year part-time PhD student. My thesis overall is exploring autistic people's inclusion and belonging within belief system contexts. And as just a bit of context as well, I'm also autistic. Um, I've popped my handle on there in case you wish to tweet along or follow me, whatever, feel, if that is something that would interest you. So in regards to where this fits into my thesis as a whole, um, this is my second study. I've undertaken a systematic literature review as my first study. Studies two and three are focus group studies, which study three I'm currently doing, and study four is going to be a narrative inquiry-based study informed by everything that I had found previously. So I'm now going to move on to presenting what I've actually got for study two. So in regards to belonging and social inclusion, these do appear to have been conceptualised in a variety of different ways in the academic literature. And certainly in regards to social inclusion, this can refer to the presence of social networks, friendships or other meaningful relationships or being among other people and this can be seen and it can be observable in nature and um, certainly in regards to perhaps the definitions given by Charlotte in 2002 this means it may be captured by measurement by watching what other people do 
and certainly from this stance it can be seen to be rooted in the ideals of disabled people having an ordinary life and social role valorization um, however i am also aware there are different um, perhaps understandings of this in the educational literature more broadly However, in regard to belonging, this is quite distinctly different to social inclusion. This is bi-directional and reciprocal, going beyond the idea of just being present in a situation. And it is an intersubjective feeling. This means it can be very difficult to capture and measure in the way perhaps that we'd look, we can do for social inclusion. And belonging has been very famously described as a universal human need by Baumeister and Leary in the academic literature. But in regards to autistic people, it does actually remain unknown how autistic people may understand belonging and social inclusion in the academic literature more broadly, in spite of their importance in a good quality of life, if you take that sort of stance on things. Definitions this far don't appear to be from people who identify as autistic, um, Robertson and myself have argued that what makes a good quality of life, for example, Shallow Cattell's 2002 framework, may be different in the autistic population. And this is a finding that was um, also exemplified in Milton and Sims' 2016 piece, paper on well being and belonging. But what we do know as previously, previously is mentioned, is social inclusion is often used as a marker to measure the quality of life of some autistic people. Now, whether this is measured in a way that's sensitive to autistic lived experience and well-being remains to be discussed and elicited, but that's certainly present in there. And furthermore, belonging has been reported as important to autistic people. And certainly in Monique Botha's description of being among likeness, very few other studies to date have explored how autistic adults understand social inclusion and belonging and what this is actually like for them in the regard to actually eliciting participants' views and experiences. So the aim for this study was to find out how autistic people conceptualize and understand belonging, social inclusion and inclusive communities. So in regards to what we did, this was a small exploratory qualitative study. And this used focus groups to collect the data with the rationale being um, to foster a common understanding amongst the people who are in the focus groups. The focus groups lasted between two and two and a half hours in length. And I had 18 autistic adults take part of which um, I'm very grateful for all their input into those focus groups, especially since they were quite long focus groups as well. A table of the demographics can be seen on the slide of the variety of participants I had take part. And the study gained a favourable ethical opinion in um, July 2020 from the University of Kent and information sheets and informed consent was gained before undertaking the research. The groups were facilitated by me um, and I think it's important to say I felt it was quite important to have um, cultural knowledge in terms of autistic culture and understanding what it's like to be autistic as the facilitator of the focus group. Um, I held the focus groups over Zoom at a mutually convenient time and also people who took part could take part using spoken words so very much like the way I'm presenting to you now just chatting through things but also in terms of taking part, people could type into the instant messaging feature in Zoom and both um, were analysed equally. And this was made available to reduce participant burden as somebody myself who does struggle with spoken word at time quite a bit. I felt this was really important in terms of participant demand and burden. So during the focus groups, um, I provided some definitions of social inclusion and belonging and participants discussed these. And these were informed by the findings of literature searching of these two concepts. And finally, um, participants were given some questions to discuss on their own personal experiences. Data was analysed using thematic analysis 
and four themes were found in the data. And all participant information, including their names, have been pseudonymized. So the names you will see with the supporting quotes are in not any way related to the participants, to make that clear. So in regards to what I found, I'm quite a visual person and I like pictures. So I made a matrix. So to give a bit of a visual description for anyone who may be visually impaired, this is a, a diagram with four squares on it and each square has either two or three bubbles coming off of it. The first bubble is theme one, that's red, that's called nebulousness. Theme two is orange and that's a bi-directional relationship. Theme three, degrees of belonging and this is yellow and theme four is barriers and this is green and I'll come back to these colours as well in regards to mapping them onto another study later on. So in regards to the first theme, oh there we go, it's now working now, in regards to the first theme nebulousness this looked at the lack of certain and overall outlined definition of both social inclusion and belonging in the views of participants and the three sub themes that were found here were innate, various and a journey. So innate as a sub theme it explores the humanness and universal nature that accompanies the ideas of social inclusion and belonging and in particular belonging which echoes Baumeister and Leary's 1995 definition. Ellie exemplifies this with I do think it's innate need it does feel like that to me. The sub theme various explores the differences in the definitions that participants had including the ideas that belonging and social inclusion were bigger than people and that the definitions that I provided in the focus groups and informed by the literature searches were vague and lacked, specific, spe lacked specificity. And Ian stated, I think they cover different aspects of it. I think belonging is bigger than either of them. And the sub theme of journey saw both social inclusion and belonging as dynamic entities which are not automatically merited or given and they can operate very separately. And Lisa aptly expresses this with, I think you can feel socially included without feeling a sense of belonging. The second theme, a bi-directional relationship, exemplified the bi-directionality and intersubjectivity of what was going on in these phenomenon. And the three sub-themes that emerged here were autistic voice, interactional and breakdown. So the first theme, autistic voice, explored the specific nuances that being autistic had on experiences of belonging and social inclusion, including agency over the way to belong and the role of knowing oneself in this bi-directional relationship. Anna sums this up with, I think society in general can be very prescriptive and judgmental. I don't really want to be a part of that. The second sub theme interactional explored the direct bi-directionality of both social inclusion and belonging. In spite of some, when I did a couple of the literature searching, some of the definitions of social inclusion were not very bi-directional in nature. And this was also considered to be really important in terms of maintaining belonging as well. As Jenna shared, for inclusion for autistic people requires recognizing it's not just that autistic people require understanding on the part of larger society as well. And here the two way nature of belonging and social inclusion is exemplified within the role of wider society in terms of how autistic people are understood. And the third sub theme breakdown explored what happens when there's a rupture in this bi-directional and intersubjective relationship and in what way. And often there only needs to be a one way breakdown for this belonging or social inclusion to be lost. One example of this was given by Harry on reflection of his autistic and queer identities. I was also excluded as I got older for being gay, but in the beginning, I don't think there was any other reason for me to feel that way, other than being autistic and not recognizing those relationships. The third theme, Degrees of Belonging, examines how people constitute that they belong or are included and inversely how they are excluded. And the two sub-themes here are acceptance and exclusion. 
and acceptance of something describes the what participants felt helped them to belong or feel included within relationships and environments. And this includes common interests and values, an openness to diversity, lacking judgment, trust, and being validated and being able to be their authentic selves. Autistic spaces, including the first focus group in particular, was reported for some as a safe space. And as Emily states, socializing of autistic people or people who are neuro neurodivergent that's just i guess easier because we have more common ground and we can um, bond over the dif differences like the quote unquote differences that we have and sensory and communication needs being met was also a significant factor in feeling included feeling socially included and feeling a sense of belonging. And online spaces and other metaphysical spaces were also reported as value in fostering inclusion on this basis in a variety of contexts. And the sub-theme exclusion examines factors and experiences which led to feelings of exclusion and a lack of belonging or social inclusion. And this includes a variety of experiences, including a lack of support or needs not being met, judgment, misunderstanding, bullying, rejection, and discrimination against other intersectional identities. One example was given by Louise and her experience with bullying in a variety of settings. I've, I've been bullied across quite a lot of contexts and in many, many places. Sunday school, sometimes even name of club, you know, primary school, secondary school, even on name of youth programme. And I redacted the names of the club and the youth programme to protect Louise's uh, anonymity here. And one particular point which was raised by participants was that they were unable to find a way in to social groups, in spite of how hard they tried. And this is summed up really well with this quote from Sabrina. I was going to say um, something that Lisa said resonated when you said something like, there's no in. And the final theme, Barriers, explores the various aspects that can hinder a fostering of social inclusion and belonging. And the sub-themes here are cultural and stigma. So stigma as a sub-theme explores the notion that autistic people are a stigmatized people who can be considered to be different and or deviant due to how we look, appear and come across. Many, autistic, many participants report having to mask their authentic selves in order to be accepted into groups or, con or different contexts. And Felicity expresses this with her experience of masking. I'm the opposite. I like your comment there, John. You said, like a chameleon to fit in. And that's, that's what I've been since I've been very, very young. And what's particularly interesting here is going back and having a look at the codes which fell into this sub theme, both codes for passing and masking, referring to Goff Goffman 1963 did occur. However, in this study, participants did elicit more response which fitted masking more frequently than passing. And when discussing passing and masking, often the term masking was used heavily interchangeably. How autistic people are perceived was also seen to be highly stigmatizing and also a barrier to diagnosis, identification, support and inclusion more broadly. Alice emphasized this with her experience during her time at school. Like, I went through my school time being told there was no way I was autistic because like I showed empathy and things. Jenna shakes her head, which is like a horrible stereotype of men in general. And the final sub thing, cultural, looks at systemic barriers which further perpetuate exclusion and a lack of belonging. And this includes groups being unaware of a group dynamic and group culture and the ex expectation to conform with the majority. John expresses this with the following in regards to his experience of church. They're not aware of their own kind of cultural rules. And um, if they become, could become more self-aware, then they'd find it easier to be more welcoming. So in regards to discussing these findings and finding where they fit into the academic literature, the first thing to note in examining the themes and sub-themes I have 
is how heavily some of these ideas and themes and sub themes actually overlap onto findings of Milton's and Sims study of well being and social belonging in autistic people. So, their study used secretary data of back episodes of Asperger's United magazine um, rather than eliciting primary data from participants directly, like in my study. However, this close tri triangulation supports the findings in this current study. And the themes in my study, which overlapped the most with some of the themes in Milton Sims study were a bi-directional relationship, so theme two, degrees of belonging, theme three, and barriers, theme four. And I've, over, I've done a very fun mapping exercise I did last night, looking at which themes did seem to graze really closely. And there were so many, I thought I'd be sitting here talking all afternoon. So I've created a small visual. Um, and so the corresponding color from my presentation that I gave at the beginning overlaps with the theme in Milton and Sims paper. So orange corresponds to a bi-directional relationship, yellow to degrees of belonging, and green to barriers. And in regards to my findings more generally, both social inclusion and belonging did appear not to be clearly defined by participants, but belonging was seen as a human need, which as I've said a few times, does echo Baumeister and Leary's 1995 definition. And this also affirms the humanity of autistic people who under various guises have been framed as needing intervention to attain humanness. Of particular note, autistic people saw both in social inclusion and bi-directional as, no, social inclusion and belonging as bi-directional and inter intersubjective in this study and not just belonging as found in some of the academic literature around social inclusion. An autistic lived experience was considered a very important factor in belonging and social inclusion, in particular with the sub theme autistic voice. Breakdowns in this relationship often seem to be a result of the double empathy problem. And this, many of us will be aware of the double empathy problem, but a quick description for anyone who is not particularly au fait with it. This occurs when autistic and non-autistic people find it hard to empathise with different life worlds and the theme barriers and the sub-theme interactional both exemplify this quite strongly. The bi-directional nature of social inclusion and belonging reported by participants along with the sub-theme acceptance also supports findings of autistic people having a potentially better rapport with other autistic people as well as the double empathy problem more broadly. And experiences of belonging and inclusion appeared to shape participants' views on social inclusion and belonging as well. Shared values, acceptance, trust, and an accessible environment appeared to assist feelings of social, being socially included and belonging. And this is notably of the sub theme acceptance, which supports Butha et al.'s 2021 study on autistic community connectedness which notes belongingness as a key feature. And Jones et, al. 20, Jones et al's 2021 study on the experiences of inclusion and exclusion of autistic people in Australia. Participants also reported multiple experiences of exclusion and oppression due to being autistic or different, or a combination of being autistic with other intersectional identities, for example, being from an ethnic minority background. Um, and this further echoes Jones et al's 2021 findings where 70% of the autistic respondents felt socially isolated and 47% had lost friends due to being autistic. And there were barriers faced in feeling a sense of belonging and being socially included, including stigma faced. Many of the autistic participants in this study reported masking in many cases to be included. And there were also aspects which would elicit passing as well. This links to some of the current literature surrounding masking and social identity theory more broadly. So in regards to next steps, I'm currently on my third study, which is another focus group study. And I'm just going to do a cheeky plug here, having checked that it was OK with a couple of colleagues yesterday. I'm still desperately looking for Christians, Muslims, Hindus and humanists to take part in some focus groups. So if you are interested, please do let me know. Um, 
because this would this will be the next step in my PhD. And um, references, very happy for people to email me with any questions, follow me on Twitter, tweet me, message me on ResearchGate, whatever works best for you. Sometimes I'm a little bit slow on email because I am part time, but I will get back to you. And thank you for a short amount of time that I've had to share my work and study. Thanks, Chrissy. Uh, can you You're stop? Really oh, I'll stop sharing. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've got Nikki available. Right. Hello, you have to bear with me for a minute while I work out how to share my screen. This always completely freaks me oh. out. So it will happen. Let's um, try. Oh, here it is. Uh, questions uh, to destroy your to I think in the Q&A Christia later yeah that's yeah that's fine um can you can I just check have I shared my screen we have yeah. it just needs to go into into full version slide and then you're good to go yeah slideshow hang on okay do you want me to go into it now or do you want yeah. to take a couple of questions you could go into it which now. one <laughs> now or yeah, the presentation. Okay, well, I'll start with an. Yeah, brilliant. I'll start with an apology because this is basically something that I've cobbled together at the last minute, and the previous presenter slides are intimidatingly fantastic. So well done for that. Um, and um, we just thought this would be an opportunity to share some of the stuff that's going on within the Critical Autism and Disability Studies Research Group at London South Bank University. Um, as I said before, CADS, we call it for short, it's not a really good acronym, I do appreciate that actually. Um, CADS is, is the effectively the first home of PARC, and one of the principles which underpins all the research that comes out of CADS is that it's always participatory. We aspire towards emancipatory research, but we would not say that we are there yet, because Principles of emancipatory research, including stakeholder involvement and usefulness. We feel that we follow these effectively, but we've not yet been in a situation where an autistic researcher is a principal investigator on any of our projects. So then there are always aspects of who is controlling the research agenda and so on, which is entirely relevant in terms of emancipatory research. Our underpinning principles in CADS is that funded autistic research is done by paid autistic researchers. So each of our projects involves paid autistic researchers. And another aspect of employment, of course, is we can't just really have employment up to the front door and then ignore the fact that somebody who is autistic may find a chaotic working environment difficult to deal with and just expect them to get on with it. So another principle is a supportive working environment for everybody who's involved in CADS research, but being mindful of the possible requirements of autistic researchers. So that's the sort of um, background of our projects in terms of the way we try to work. And all the projects have steering groups of autistic people as well as paid autistic researchers. So I'm going to talk very briefly about a couple of projects just to give you a little bit of flavour of some of the stuff we're doing at the moment. Uh, both of them, the, these current projects, are funded by the John and Lorna Wing Foundation. So this first one is been going for a couple of years now and was sort of slightly scuppered by COVID but we will be reporting in um, December. Um, Joe Krupper, who's a PhD student, is on, is on the call and may want to chip in at some point as she's actually the principal person involved in this project, which was about thinking about the well-being of older autistic adults who also have intellectual impairments and their family carers. And on the research team, there's me, Professor Eddie Chaplin, who I've already mentioned, who also has an excellent background in criminology, and um, Joe Krupa, um, Gina Knowles, who is a, a family carer, 
Paula Sanchez, who is a, a PhD student here, Mickey May, who is also a PhD, he's got his PhD from here, and Professor Richard Mills was the, was the advisor on the project. So um, the other project, the lead for the other project is Dr. Nick Chown, and I'm sure that people are familiar with Nick's work because he is pretty well published. And the other project that we're involved in is about access to health checks for autistic adults. Um, this thing about um, annual health checks being part of the offer, which GPs are supposed to be offering to autistic adults, focusing really on people with additional intellectual impairments mainly, and the extent to which this happens and what we can do to make this more accessible um, as, a, as, as an entitlement rather than thing, something that some people know about and some people don't know about. Some, people, some GPs are confident and some feel that they need some greater understanding of autism in order to fulfil this fun function effectively. And um, we have a, a steering group of actually autistic doctors who are involved in this project, which is incredibly useful. And we're focusing on training needs of GPs as well as ensuring that the health that the, the health checks are something that are known about. So with both the projects, ultimately the aim is to create something useful which makes life a little bit easier in respect of um, well-being and health and so on, you know, joined up thinking, obviously underpinning this. And the projects sort of intersect with each other now, although this is a recent one that's not reporting for a year and the other one is sort of near the end of it. This one actually has thrown up quite a lot about, um, you know, this is about GP access to health checks, but what about dental checks? And what about the whole mental health um, scene as well? in terms of access to um, good quality mental health services and so on. So we think this pro project might extend beyond the year and we're hoping so, we've had a lot of interest in it. And also we're part of the um, Westminster Autism Commission who are also interested in this project. So over, overlapping both of them, we want to find out what sort of support is helpful and is the available support helpful and easy to access, as well as finding out what sort of support is available? Is it actually any use to anybody and is it easy to access? One of the things that we're finding, of course, and to be no surprise to anybody, is access to information is quite problematic. So if you're an older adult, you might be, say, in your 80s, and you, your son or daughter is a person who is autistic but has additional intellectual impairments and needs a high level of support, are you necessarily going to be that person that's completely IT savvy, able to look up information on the internet, etc.? And if not, how are you getting hold of the information? And of course, this population is quite difficult to research with because there's a whole gatekeeper function around, um, around the statutory services and people are not going to respond to sort of email, email and um, internet-based calls for participation and so on. And really, we're just interested in your ideas about how we reach these populations, particularly as COVID obviously made the face-to-face -face stuff that we were planning actually impossible to carry out. So... Um, and it says up here, what sort of voluntary and statutory services might work? Because what we were interested in was not only um, what your, your GP and your lo local social services, et cetera, are supposed to provide. Also, what is available in the community that people might want to access? And what isn't available in the community that people might actually like if it was there? And it's just a fact, really, that state-run services are not doing it all. And there are various interventions going on, localised sort of interventions, but are they accessible to the populations that we're discussing? So we're asking practitioners, family carers, and autistic people to think about services which might work effectively and how these could be organised in practical terms. So very simple research questions about, you know, what would you really like? 
key question for older carers is how do you get on with the internet obviously and and we were coming last time we talked about this which was also at a part meeting and apologies to anybody who find is finding these slides a little bit familiar because i have talked about this before we were looking at things like would you like help getting onto the internet maybe a device would help you maybe you need to be taught how to use it and one of our um, focus groups has actually um, concentrated on uh, a residential facility for older autistic adults with intellectual impairments and how carers and parents and families and loved ones are keeping in contact with people who are in this residential facility and this has been really down to the um, the, the location they've been very proactive in getting the parents on FaceTime, on Zoom, et cetera, et cetera. And that's one of the things that we'll be reporting on. We're also, uh, we also divided our um, participant pools, if you like, into people who were located in rural areas and people who were located in urban areas or within the rural areas. Um, this is where we're working with this um, residential provider for example and within the urban area we're, we're working quite closely with autism voice which is an organization a charity set up for um, autistic families from bame communities and this is throwing up a lot of interesting information about the rural urban divide in terms of access to services and and um, you know the sort of inner city um, countryside location considerations as well as cultural considerations and everything else so you know it, it is it is very very interesting and this whole thing about health checks obviously has been absorbed into the questions that we ask these groups as well as reaching out and talking to doctors about the, the, their training needs etc cetera, etc cetera. so and why is it important? We've done obviously an extensive um, literature search, and um, this is just one sort of key article that I thought was was illustrative, really, about cooperation between specialist intellectual disability and generic elderly services being required. People with intellectual disabilities are living longer, therefore possibly will outlive their parents but also elderly parents are looking after people with intellectual disabilities and people with autism and intellectual dis disabilities. And the, there may be conflicting needs, you know, put simply, what if the parent suddenly has a stroke? And I think anybody who's involved in this area of work, they know that this is the worst fear of parents. What is going to happen to my son or daughter when I'm not able to look after them anymore? So um, this is why we really want to be able to talk to elderly parents about this agenda. So these are just examples. There's all sorts of voluntary groups and all sorts of things going on, but we are unconvinced that um, the people that need to know about them do know about them. One of the things that we suggested with our steering group was that we created um, a directory, if you like, for local authorities, which talked about statutory provision and entitlement, talked about local provision, which was available from the charity sector and, their, and, and national provision available from the charity sector, for example, National Autistic Society, Age Concern, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that the directory was also kept up by the local authority or the health commissioners or whoever, on their website and the feedback we got was that was a ridiculous idea because who is going to be responsible for keeping up the information and we're moving now towards the idea of posters in gp surgeries which um, which share information in a much more immediate way if you like but we you know we're not sure that that's effective either um just more examples of um you know, Surrey Health and Wellbeing Strategy, Autism Partnership Boards, Carers Trust, Family Caregivers Support Programme, Disability Empower Network, Surrey, all these sort of examples of things that are going on, local National Autistic Society branches, the NAS, etc. But not a clear joined up picture of if you were somebody who was 
um, becoming elderly yourself, becoming concerned with significant care and responsibilities, no clear picture about who it is that you could reach out to for support or how you would go about it. Or if you wanted to make sure that your son or daughter had an annual health care check, but your GP wasn't really on board with it or confident about it, how that would work. Um, so, you know, looking at the um, requirements that come out of government, the 2018 evaluation of the 2014 government autism strategy, Think Autism, talking about organisations involved in self-assessment, involving local authorities, health commissioners, other statutory partners, involvement of local assisted residents and family carers, looking at planning, training, diagnosis, care and support, housing, accommodation, employment, criminal justice, um, systems, local innovations. And it says some progress has been made since 2016 in planning for older autistic adults. But older age is not a specific focus. So although we have the Autism Act and all the subsequent modifications and developments, there's always been this feeling the autism that hasn't really translated necessarily into proactive action. And when you think about GP assessment, a GP um, training rather, there are all sorts of recommendations about training for people involved in public bodies, but scant evidence that it's a thing that actually has, has really taken hold. And we argue very strongly, of course, that training about autism needs to be delivered by autistic people. And we also argue that capturing the views of autistic people needs to include the views of people whose main means of communication isn't necessarily verbal. So this will all be part of our project, obviously. So we wanna know what you think. Please use the chat. Project aims to identify good practice and gaps, disconnects in statutory and voluntary services and come up with great stakeholder informed ideas about ways in which services could be improved in relation to older autistic adults and in relation to healthcare checks. So what do you think? What do you understand about available services? How can we take the project forward? How can we make sure that people access information even if it's not via the internet? Um, and this is a, just a bit more about the healthcare checks, um, about GP training, about access to the information, etc. So if you want to make use of the Q&A function on Teams, but I'm going to put some contact, you no, know, on Zoom, we're on Zoom today, aren't we? I'm going to put some contact information in the link as well. So Nick Chown is the key um, contact for the healthcare project. And Joe Cooper is the key contact for the older 40, older aged 45 plus project. And this is our umbrella, really, Critical Autism and Disability Studies Research Group at London South Bank University. And obviously nothing about us without us is, is one of our underlying principles, but that does extend to the fair employment of autistic researchers in autism research, because everybody in this room, I'm sure, will be acutely aware of being asked to give their expertise for nothing all the time. Or well, we're trying to move away from that and influence that agenda as well. So that's all I've got for you, because it's a quick cobble together. But, you know, questions, discussion, really welcome. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I hope that was some use to you. OK, back in the room. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, Hi there. Uh, we do have some questions um, for both yourself and Krisha. Um, are you happy for me to, oh, Damien, I'll come to you first. I was just thinking with finishing this session about 10 minutes early, so we could have a longer discussion or people could have a short comfort break because um, we yes. haven't scheduled one in for this time but that oh, that's a good idea can well. I just say before you do that just very briefly I know that Joe's here and I just wonder if Joe Cruper who's one of our PhD students who's who's the lead on the over 45 project Joe if you want to say anything I'm putting you right on the spot and you don't have to but just quickly if there's anything that you do want to say 
just invited Joe across. So oh, okay. oh yeah, thank you. I forgot about the technology. Sorry, I thought we were just didn't really need the technical <laughs> help. From Neil, Doesn't though. work like that, does it? <laughs> um, Neil, do you want to uh, ask the questions on the? Sure. So, jo Joe, you're welcome to join us. Um, yeah, actually, just, just wade in, Joe. Perfect. Oh, there she is. Hi, Joe. <laughs> Nothing like being put on the spot. See, I see you're not in your 90, so that's good. <laughs> I, <laughs> I just have to change quickly on my running gear. So. <laughs> um, I haven't got a huge amount to add, other than um, I suppose one of the things we were looking at. Um, one of the things we wanted to try um, in terms of activities was looking at, we were look, wanting to focus on kind of support groups because obviously we knew that there was no money in the project and there won't be any money in future, um, unfortunately, the way things are going. So it was we were sort of wanting to focus on how um, adults, uh, autistic adults with intellectual impairments and also their carers could support each other. So thinking about... Um, technology is you know setting up Facebook groups or WhatsApp groups so not just in terms of our communicating with them but something that they continue um, in the long term as well so um, that was just another thing that we were thinking of yeah. uh, but I think yeah. you've covered most of it yeah but, and there's a point here by um, I can't quite read the name because it's half off the screen it's sad he um, sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right talking about the voices of non-white people often missing in research and accessing autism services. Absolutely. And this is where Autism Voice are really helping us because of their um, focus on people from BAME communities. But absolutely, we should identify that as one of our principles with CADS, actually, because we do it, but we haven't identified it as one of our core principles. But we, this is our core practice, so we must write that down. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, and um, yeah, Autism Voice are a great organisation that we work mm -hmm. with. So, um, focusing. I expect on there's some Autism Voice people here at the moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're doing great work. Okay, so we do have some time for questions. If you have any other que if you have questions, please do pop them in the Q and A box. Don't pop them in the chat box because okay. we want to keep track of them and work our way through them. Um, Krisha, if you're happy, first question is for you. Um, do you use do you inc do you include participants who were autistic and had have other comorbid conditions such as dyslexia and dyspraxia? Yes, in short. So I didn't see the point in excluding people on that basis I think the uh, the main inclusion criteria for the focus groups I did in the first round and these were with autistic people with any belief system or none I just wanted to establish what was going on for autistic people more broadly so basically people had to either be identified or self-identify as autistic either with a diagnosis or personally self-identifying and I think what I, I did collect what how people identified obviously people said if they did self-identify or if they used a diagnostic term or whatever else just for background and it was quite interesting because I did manage to get so I had 18 participants and I had five who were not Caucasian so not white and what was interesting is everybody nearly everybody I got who wasn't from a white background didn't have a diagnosis or official identification but that's completely not related to the questions I've got to answer a different question yes I did include people who were otherwise neurodivergent as well as who had other neurodivergences and support needs as well as being autistic thank you um, Nikki, one for you, I'm from Angela. Do you have any plans to research older adults who are autistic, for example, late diagnosed autistic women who are struggling to get appropriate access to their GPs? There are many of us and a lot of struggling. And that would fit right in to the annual health care check um, project. So yes, and if you want to contact Nick or me, um, that would be absolutely brilliant because the focus seems to be about autistic people with additional intellectual impairments, but the steering group and everybody else says, all autistic people need this. And I'm sure one of our recommendations of our project is why are the criteria narrowly drawn? Narrowly drawn because autistic people are um, 
protected for want of a better word, I don't think it's a great word, by the Equality Act. So I think one of our recommendations is going to be drop the and intellectual impairment business because that's sort of not really relevant to health specifically anyway, is it? So yes, yes, we do. And we're hoping to carry on with this project with additional funding as well, because we have to stay within the scope of the funding bid, but it doesn't mean we can't make recommendations which go beyond it. So we absolutely welcome your input. Thank you. Um, a question for Nikki, but happy to throw this out to the, to the floor as well. Have you considered barriers to using the phone, not just for non-speakers, but for those of us who have severe anxiety with phone conversations, yeah. fully independent, but still struggle with contacting the doctor because it means I have to use the phone? And that's already come up in the steering group. The gatekeeper function of the receptionist and the thing about having to use the phone and the development of the sort of online appointments with COVID, et cetera, and how that will impact. But yes, it's, yes, it's already come up, absolutely. And the thing is, this must feature in the GP training, but the GP training has to extend to everybody that's going to come in, in contact with you when you're trying to access a, a, a GP appointment. So, yeah. And Damien, I think well, you're going to say something, Damien. Well, I've had many poor experiences with reception staff in doctor's surgeries both for myself and my son and appointments mm. and it can really mess things up uh, and raise your stress levels up um i was once told by a receptionist whilst looking over my shoulder to see where my son was so he wasn't running out of the automatic doors uh, to look them in the eye. So they were having um, an inspection that day, so I wrote my feedback on a card and popped it in their box. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't too pleasant. But mm. then if you add to that a phone call where you can't see the person and mm. what's happening or there's no way of complaining and so on, it can be very uh, disempowering um, exactly. and off-putting and then you're not contacting the doctor because you don't want to go th through the stress of having to make an appointment and it's a very common issue uh, Mary Doherty who's presented mm -hmm. at Park before mm -hmm. uh, done a lot of work in this area and uh, the Westminster Commission report, mm. we were both involved with Nikki and I with uh, access to healthcare. The phone calls are a major stumbling block. Mm. And can I just add to that in terms of access? The um, residential um, environment that we're working in, the rural residential environment, they are trying to get a system going where the GP comes to the um, residents rather than the, the residents going to the GP particularly when it's things like injections as well you know it's just adding in the whole sensory overload environment in the GP surgery and then giving somebody an injection massively not conducive to reducing anxiety and building trust. Mm. Thank you. We have um, a couple of comments in the chat box actually um, re regarding this topic um, also aphasia um, so important for people who can't use the phone. Um, yeah. And Kat says, um, autistic experience of, of telehealth is my likely dissertation project this year. Um, so Brilliant. Kat's, Kat's, put, Kat's, Kat's put their details in the chat box if you would like to um, to get yeah. in touch. Um, OK, so moving on to our next question, Krisha, this is one another one for you. Um, okay. Have you ever dealt with family not accepting an Asperger's syndrome diagnosis, then using it against you so you're excluded? If I answer from the kind of a personal perception and a kind of data perception, that will probably be easier. From, from what came from the data, it did become clear that actually some people had either disclosed or kind of come out to people and then had been rejected. So there was quite a strong, there were codes when I was coding the transcripts around rejection and some of it was to do with family, although there was also supportive family members as well in the small data set I had. And in regards to personal experience, probably not so much with family, but certainly with 
friends and former friends I've had that I think where people don't necessarily and this is where what was particularly interesting with my data um, people have very don't understand what or to kind of what autistic people are so they have these preconceived ideas and certainly I've had friends in the past I've told them I'm autistic and all of a sudden they just disappear I'm like oh okay right <laughs> And um, certainly that was also in the data as well, that people had very interesting perceptions of what autistic people were and the impact on the participants. And that was reported quite strongly. I think a lot of it's to do with internalised ableism and stereotypes about autism and how it's been represented over the years. And so when it was first being muted about my son, I was in denial. He's not autistic, he's just like I was at that age. (laughs) And so it it takes time sometimes for family members to get their head around this autism label because it's associated with so much stigma and bad things. And it's not... uh, a realistic representation of autism though that people are connecting with and so it's kind of brain man and god knows what so um family members though if they start well how do you see this family member of yours and their quirks their eccentricities and soon you get these things coming out you say well this is what it's like be autistic it's not all uh, negative necessarily and these sorts of conversations people over time do start accepting if they have a more holistic view and experience over time so hopefully anyway not all family members necessarily accept but often over time people do Definitely. There's some there's some comments in the chat box that I'd just like to refer people to. Um, so Anne says, and for sure, if we disclose that we're autistic and someone just disappears from our lives as a result of that disclosure, um, they were never a friend. Um, and then Stephen um, pops an interesting comment in there. So much support is framed around more obvious support needs, which is obviously vital to support. But as an autistic person who's doing well and appears to require no support, it's so difficult to try and articulate where I need support or to even feel valid in doing so. Thank you for sharing um, those comments in there. Um, Next comment, a question from Andrew um, and Joe and Nikki, I'll pop this one over to you if that's okay. Um, I wonder whether LSBU and other universities could liaise with local charities, e.g. Pact for Autism, um, is a local charity in me to help raise funding, gain funding for more support. Well, that's a a really complicated one, isn't it? Because there's this, I, I can see as a private individual, that would be something that I would be really interested in doing. And as a researcher, I would certainly be wanting to recommend that, you know, that the whole funding issue will always come up in research in relation to researching services. But as a university, there's this sort of mission creep thing, isn't there? Is that if we sort of dilute our role, that might not be the best, the best approach. I think universities can support charities in other ways in terms of involving the charity sector in research and making recommendations which are going to help the charity sector gain funding and so on. But I think we have to sort of be a little bit careful about exactly how we interact with charities, I would say, off the top of my head. I don't know whatever, because, you know, for every charity we sort of almost like endorse, there'll be another one that says endorse us next. You know, it's difficult. I think it's complicated, uh, actually. I don't know what you think, Joe, because Joe's been a social worker. Yeah. Um, and the project in a sense each mm. case might be different and what the idea is what the connection would be but it'd yeah. be worth getting in contact and discussing oh ideas. yeah yeah so i think universities can indirectly help charities without endorsing them i suppose i would say oh did you want to come in there 
I think no, I think Nikki said it all. But other than yeah, I mean we so we you know Waters and Voices a charity that we're that we're working with, but <clears throat> in terms of we're sort of co-researching with them really. Yeah. All, you know, that, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. So we've got time for two more questions, and then we will grab a five minute comfort break. Um, Nikki, uh, from your presentation, why was the focus lacking for older adults, and where can I we also look for more research base for us in Asia? Now that I don't know the answer to that in relation to Asia, although um, in relation to the focus being lacking for older autistic adults, I think I think it's to do with the adult autism strategy not particularly being strong on 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 the older age demographic. I think it's it's a it's a gap in the strategy. Although they talk about a live course approach and you know. Um, from the point of diagnosis right through your life and everything else it's um I think younger adults have um things like the children and families act up to 25 and all that sort of thing and then there's a little bit of a a falling down a hole I would say I think it's not a joined up enough strategy is the answer and I I think it's wrong and but there's actually not a great deal of research about older age anyway um, so it's, I think it's to do with budgets, to do with um, priorities, and I think it's really wrong. And in relation to Asia as well, I would say my, my um, research background is not, isn't, doesn't extend to Asia, but I, I'm pretty convinced that the situation will be very, very similar in Asia, that older, the older adult demographic is is not really the focus of very much research and it really should be I mean I don't think that answers your question really I think there might be something about cultural and societal views of old age in in this country at least anyway yeah I think you're right and the whole thing about the carers is really really significant because when an invisible population of carers is filling a gap in service provision People are not necessarily shouting about it. And older carers are not the most vocal people about and not that great at making demands. And it might be that their autistic son or daughter is of an age where they didn't even have the opportunity for formal um, education authority schooling. You know, it could be that they always just manage the situation within the family you know don't know what's out there because it's not well publicized is it thank you and if anyone does want to take a comfort break please feel free to do so but i just want to address one more question that's popped up and it's jumped to the top because a couple of people have have upvoted it have any of the panel had experience of including non-speaking autistic people in research both as participants and in co-production damien come to you first um yes in various ways it's uh my own son's largely non-speaking and the two of us have participated in projects in the past. Not many, I may add, because the ethical concerns I have for much autism research kind of leaves a lot out. But um, there has been work by park members over the years, uh, the late Dr. Dinah Murray, um, Susie Riddell, uh, Sally Brett, a um, number of uh, projects. Uh, often it's quite difficult getting the funding involved because um, when one says non speaking autistic people, you're looking at huge breadth of different needs and uh, communication methods and tools. And in terms of research, what that means is creativity and flexibility, being person-centred and and taking the ethics very seriously and so on. And it's not easy to do that. And being creative and flexible is not always um, seen as rigorous by those giving out funding for research. So you're battling all kinds of barriers just to get projects off the ground um but then just because something's difficult shouldn't mean we shouldn't do it or try so a lot of us 
do do work in that area. Um, so it depends on the kind of project in a sense and what the main focus is, but mm -hmm. often uh, the numbers in recruitment are much lower as well. Um, so there's difficulties sometimes uh, finding a broad range of people to work with and so on. But there has been some really good work, as I say, over time as well. I, I Can I just add an, our older autistic adult project, um, all through the proposal, we talked about that whole agenda of um, participants who may not be communicating verbally. Um, but we've had such difficulty with, with gatekeepers and with COVID that actually accessing the people that we want to um, gather their views from in the first place is really difficult. But we, we always talk about communication in our um, MA education autism at South Bank. And, you know, we, we encourage students to really embrace this whole area of research. And Sally Brett's doctorate, which she did at South Bank, was about education healthcare plans, um, getting views from pupils in the, in the education healthcare plan review meeting when they were not communicating verbally and needed to communicate in other ways. And her doctorate is actually quite influential and influenced another project we did, which was looking at the sensory environment in a, in a consortium of schools in a local authority and engaging with um, non-verbal um, people who communicated in different ways as well. So it was always on our agenda, but everything that Damien says is absolutely true as well. Sometimes ethics is problematic. Just a quick response to that. There's a couple of questions in the Q&A around pre and postnatal support and research. Uh, one of the people who presented the path in the past, uh, Hayley Morgan and colleagues in Wales has done some work in this area. And there's also a recent book out by Alexis Quinn, um, an autistic author who's excellent on many issues. So I'd recommend that as well. So just a quick response to those questions. Thank you. There are. Um, if anyone would like to type an answer to those uh, those questions in the Q and A box, please do feel free. I'm very conscious of time. Damien, I'll hand over to you to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank uh, you. So, very pleased to be handing over to Monique, who's just joined us. Um, and uh, you may have seen a recent article by Monique, which. Uh, I would highly recommend reading um, and talks about many of the issues we face, especially here at PAR, trying to encourage participatory research. So I uh, very much look forward to what Monique's got to say today. Over to you, Monique. Thank you, Damien. I'll just share my screen quickly and get this going. Um... Wonderful. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm obviously Monique both and my pronouns are they, them, if you're asking me questions. Um, and I'm based at the University of Stirling and I'm going to be talking about, um, in fact, I'm going to put my video off because my internet's a bit slow, so um, make it easier. So I'm going to be talking about critical realism and community psychology and how it facilitates a um, practice of social justice. Um, so I'm going to quickly cover a bit about who I am and introduce community psychology, talk about philosophy of science and why it matters, um, some traditional frameworks for it, um, and why I think personally that critical realism might be better for community psychology. Um, and lastly, how it shapes social justice for the autistic community and why that really matters. So a bit about me. Um, I usually begin my talks by introducing myself so that people can understand my positionality. I'm an autistic autism researcher and I consider myself a community psychologist, which I'll explain. 
I'm currently an ESRC postdoc fellow at the University of Stirling, Scotland, having just moved up in Scotland. It's very beautiful. Um, I love it. Um, I did my PhD and MSc at the University of S um, Surrey in psychology. And before that, I did um, social care practice in Ireland at AIT. Um, and I worked as a social care worker with autistic people and their families during my undergraduate. Um, so I moved from applied to quite researchy um, and I never really left the applied tradition behind because um, I think it's really important actually. So, and just to warn you that this talk is the tip of the iceberg on the topic of um, critical realism. And when I say that, I literally mean this talk is that little slice up there and that the critical realism framework and literature is so much deeper um, so this really is surface level. But first, um, let's introduce community psychology. So community psychology is a field dedicated to understanding the contexts in which individuals exist and how those contexts influence their health, well-being, quality of life. Really importantly, it's underpinned by specific values such as social justice. It's intended to be transformative in nature Aiming, aiming to not only understand, but to address existing inequalities with social action, right? So it's meant to be applied. The goal is not only to produce knowledge, but to produce knowledge and action which can generate change for the communities that you belong to or are working with. There are interrelated fields born out of other contexts like liberation psychology, which is literally, as it says, using liber um, psychology for the liberation of people from social oppression, which originates from the South Americas, and they're interlinked, but I wouldn't collapse them into each other because I think that does it a disservice. Um, primarily, the, the field was born out of the disenfranchisement clinical psychologists encountered in the 1960s America. Um, and it was because psychology tends to put individuals under um, a microscope. So, you know, we think we focus on things like thinking processes, personality traits, you know, feelings and emotions and the individual actions and behaviors of people. Um, the important thing is that actually that doesn't address a lot of the problems that people have. So the history of community psychology, um, it formed during a time of fundamental social transformation in a deeply unequal society. So we're talking during things like the Stonewall riots, civil rights protests and Vietnam War protests. And what people really wanted to do was put people in their context rather than focusing on individuals, which tends to blame people for their outcomes. You know, we tend to look at behavior without looking at the, the society that people are living in. We don't look at schools and works necessarily. We don't look at the influence of homes and families. We don't look at communities or healthcare access or social and cultural values or how norms and expectations shape outcomes for marginalized communities. And specifically for autism this is really important because we tend to focus on the individual traits of autistic people rather than the context in which we make autistic people live and rather than the social and cultural values which shape autistic people's lives or the communities they belong to so community psychology tend to use um, a whole bunch of different methods but it tends to be quite grassroots it tends to involve activism and it tends to be mixed methods and hands-on. So community psychology is a rich history of things like co-production, participatory research, and things that engage, engage with mixed, creative and radical methods. Um, so this can be anything from quantitative, qualitative, ethnographic work, or things like photo and art-based work and community interventions. Because community psychologists tend to work with communities, they shape research questions and processes around those communities. So you get just about 
everything. One of my favorite community psychology studies um, used everything from an arts-based method to quite a large scale quantitative study, looking at how environments that um, people with schizophrenia influence their health. But in particular, one of the things was for people to walk around both their homes and their communities and take photos of the things that really mattered to them. Um, and these aren't methods that you necessarily see in um, a lot of psychology, which tends to focus on things like experimental work. Um, the important thing is that community psychology is often, psychologists often wear multiple hats, so they'll tend to engage with things like activism, grassroots movements in local and national contexts to generate change with evidence. And the important thing is that evidence is key. Intervention without it is unethical, specifically because you waste a community's time, you can waste precious, precious resources, um, and you might not get anywhere on solving um, or helping a community to solve the issues that they want solved. Um, community partners or community led is key. Power sharing begins from the beginning. Another project that I've loved that's come out of community psychology, especially in America, is, for example, the housing first method. Um, but regardless, when you're working with a community, especially if you're not part of that community, it needs to be with community partners um, and it needs to be with um, power sharing. So is community psychology political? Yes, because everything is political and yes, because it's about the transactional and relational nature of power, resources, knowledge and health and well-being. So community psychologists tend to want to um, you know, give whatever skills or resources that they have to their community to develop some form of change. Um, and also, yes, because it's about deconstructing and demolishing systems of oppression, which keep people trapped. Um, so it is very political. But what's the problem then? Well, people have said that community psychology lacks an underpinning and united philosophy of science. And that this should be addressed because philosophies of science act as roadmaps guiding research practice, regardless of whether the researcher is aware of it. So what this philosophy of science needs to account for to um, be able to support community psychology is something that is a value based praxis, because rather than being value free, it embodies values, it loves values, you're meant to be very transparent with your values. It needs to have multi and mixed method research. So everything from qualitative to quantitative, um, potentially experimental stuff, um, but also it needs to account for collaborative co-production across paradigms, boundaries, and subjects. So a philosophy of science describes a constellation of assumptions, for example, about ontology, which is the nature of reality epistemology, how we can actually know that reality, so how we generate things like knowledge or information, and axiology, so for example, the role of values in research, whether or not you think it's reset or value free, or whether you embody values, um, about method and what you employ to gain knowledge, um, and the objective of the actual knowledge, which is the end goal. This is summed up really well by um, Makula and Silk, who says, um, philosophy of science provide the boundaries for the researcher's ethics and values, actions in the social world, the control of the study, for example, who initiates the work and asks the questions, the voices deployed in the accounts of research, and indeed the very basic and fundamental understandings of the world the researcher is investigating. Traditional philosophies of science um, in psychology, and this is a bit separate to other social sciences potentially um, and very separate from humanities it's been underpinned by positivism logical empiricism and popperian falsification for most of its relatively short history and i'll explain what this means because that's just a whole bunch of long words that are basically meaningless unless you um, have a dictionary um, so it means ontological realism this is the idea that there is one singular reality that we are all experiencing. 
epistemological objectivism. This is the idea that objects are a real phenomenon which are primarily measurable and testable and established through the scientific method and deduction. This means that people think that reality can be established by doing things like experimental tests. You can see this um, tradition in psychology in the push for making psychology a hard science, um, which means that people want to make it more experimental because they think that that will make it more rigorous. Um, a prioritization of the scientific method is some sort of methodological savior of psychology or the idea that if we just start using things like um, the scientific method that we will suddenly become more rigorous um, and in the aim for things like generalizability. Um, so trying to make something as generalizable to as large a population as possible. Um, universality, trying to make it universal to as many people as possible and replication. And the idea that um, if we keep repeating experiments that we'll get the same result. Um, and you can also see it a bit in falsification, but that is a debate because I mean, <laughs> so the rate of getting significant results in psychology is like astoundingly high. Um, and actually, even though a lot of psychologists would say that they aim for falsification, there is debate as to whether they actually aim for verification. Um, but there are three core issues here. So one, it's meant to be value free, but this is idealistic and unachievable. So the idea that science has no social or cultural ties um, is the idea of epistemological transcendence that um, a scientist can go out there, do science and establish a view from nowhere. Um, and also that that becomes meaningful that, for example, if a scientist were to go out there, perform an experiment, come up with a result, that none of that is tied to the cultural or social background of the scientist or the society. Um, and also it's meant to be value free because of the fact value divide or this idea that you can't move from a fact to a value. So you can't move from a, this is how it is in society. Um, and this is how it should be. So there's this idea that in science, um, you should not move from um, our statements or this is the way things are to this is the way they ought to be, because that means that you're embodying values. Um, and ultimately, it ignores how people are embedded into systems of power. And a good example in autism research is the amount of violent accounts, which the paper Damien mentioned that I wrote shows, you know, we, we describe autistic people very violently in psychological research. We describe autistic people as subhuman, and then we pretend that the people generating that knowledge don't have power. But actually, even if you employ the scientific method, you'll value shape the research questions that you asked from the beginning. So it's never value free. It's based on the idea of objectivity, right? But the thing is, this prioritizes majority voices because it's unachievable for minorities. So typically objectivity means independent of the object at hand or distance from it. Objectivity is meant to be achieved through rigorous objective, namely scientific methods. But the problem is quantitative methods typically have an assumed objectivity by nature of numbers. So people don't talk about like a reflexive approach to science when they use numbers because they're like, well, numbers, I'm, I'm safe. I've got a significant result. My P value is less than point, you know, zero five. So therefore I don't need to talk about how my social and cultural value shape this research um, because it's all fine. But also minorities, because we embody the object, um, we never get to have a say in our own. So we get for example, themed non-objective and so not reliable um, narrators to our own experience, even when we employ things like numbers, for example. Um, and it's all based on the idea of the scientific method, which is methodologically um, rigid. Um, it prioritizes methods which are said to embody these two values, so objectivity and value freedom 
which means that it only recognizes certain kinds of knowledges and methods. So when autistic people produce things like autobiographies, we argue that, or psychologists argue that that can't challenge things like theory of mind literature because they're not objective, they're not value free, and they're not based in the scientific method, even though you would think that if someone could write an entire autobiography, that it means that they are taking perspective. Um, but we don't value that knowledge. So and basically, it embo embodies a tradition of experimental and quasi experimental research, which relies on quantitative phenomenon. However, not everything is measured by numbers, like not everything can be measured by numbers. So as I've said, experimental data are not value free. Values inform how experiments are made, how data is interpreted. Um, and people tend to forget that interpreting data is an action. Um, what questions are asked and also how the results are framed in the discussion. Um, psychologists misreport statistics all the time in favor more often of their own hypotheses. Um, a study found that um, over 60% of studies in two of our leading journals included um, misrepresentations of sample sizes and p-values. Um, lastly, that the idea of objectivity and value freedom have inherent power. And this has shaped how we consider autism. We reduce autism to bioessentialism um, and link it to things like the eugenic tradition. Um, we've conflated the outcomes of autistic people's lives with, for example, autism itself, the same with other disabled lives, regardless of context. Because of methodological rigidity, um, we argue that autistic people can't tell us about autism sometimes. Um, and this leads to what's called epistemic violence and also dehumanization, which means that really violent accounts are argued to be objective, while actual humanizing accounts produced by autistic people are deemed to not be scientific enough um, to challenge any of this literature. And lastly, this idea of scientific objectivity has a very strong power that has resulted in a tradition of eugenics, mass institutionalization and lobotomy, all procedures that have unduly affected autistic people um, and disabled people, and all traditions that were justified um, under the idea of um, scientific objectivity. They were like, well, it's just the science and the numbers, isn't it? Um, to challenge this, we have post-positivism. Um, and this critiques the idea that there's a single reality because it says that reality is partly constructed by our mental engagement with it and representation of it. So this is the idea that um, there is ontological relativism. There are many realities mediated by social and cultural values and meaning making. Ultimately, this results in, or some say it results in a rejection of causality in favor of a focus on lived experiences. And this is based on the idea that um, objects do not have essential qualities when we're not interacting with them. So reality is based on mental activity. And there have been massive benefits for this. So these ideas have you know, taught us that like autism, for example, is still enshrined in normativity and cultural values and positivistic um, science that has created the category of autism still embodies those values and we need to account for them. Constructivists and interpretivist accounts situate well with conversations about the social model of disability um, and about how we should be discussing things like social structures and power and normativity. Um, it's laid the ground for things like critical autism studies and critical neurodiversity studies, which have been really emancipatory for autistic people. And lastly, it's provided a skepticism around making clear how science is laid in with things like power and enshrined with social concepts. Um, this skepticism lives on in the push for participatory methods um, so that we can recenter um, disabled and autistic voices. But there are still three issues. It's been said to focus on phenomenon rather than empowerment. So it fails to acknowledge or recognize the true extent of 
um, exchange of agency and power in society, that it treats um, people as subordinate to an omnipresent force of social cultural values uncritically, because it's based on the idea of meaning making. It's got a similar methodological rigidity, which prioritizes qualitative and ethnographic um, studies instead of large um, group level data. Um, and we need group level data to understand material outcomes for things like health inequalities, early mortality to generate change. And lastly, there's an issue of potential, not always, but potential boundless relativism. If reality is only made up of at the individual level, how do we challenge misinformation, for example, because reality is individual. There's this idea that, for example, vaccines cause autism. If someone says, well, that's my experience, how do you argue against that? Because a meta-analysis isn't necessarily challenging that individual reality. Sorry, Monique, so, just, a, just, a, just a couple of minutes remaining. Okay, thank you. So why neither of these will do for community psychology? Because it's value-based. We don't pretend that there is no values. And also we cross the fact-value divide. Um, taken to the logical end, complete relativity makes it hard to justify anything actually being problems. And in community psychology, we do think there are problems, including social inequality. Um, plus, we're looking for something that can support mixed method research. Critical realism is a movement in philosophy of science developed by Roy Busker, and it posits ontological realism with epistemological relativism. So this means that entities exist in independently of our interaction with them, because not everything is made up of language and discourse, but everything is mediated through it, right? So while there is one reality, there are multiple interpretations of it. It doesn't conflate reality with the measurement of reality. And lastly, there is a focus on agency because people are open systems who change and mediate the relationships of um, between levels of reality and phenomenon. And it does this by stratifying reality. And I'll show you what I mean by that. It means that if you encompass everything in the world, that's the real, that's everything. But there's a layer of actual, which is the mechanisms which might be observed or unobserved generated by the real, but only part of that is empirical. And that's what we can actually observe. The reason that this is important um, is that by not reducing these layers to each other, we can differentiate between what autism actually is and what people's discussion of what autism is. Um, it also opens up the door to multiple and mixed methods because you've got to understand both what autism is on the real level, but also the experience of it. To do this, you need transdisciplinary and insider knowledge. And also, you can bridge between the fact value divide with agency and the idea that actually you can make change between these layers of reality. Importantly, reflexivity is key because knowledge is mediated through the self and the social. And I'm just going to skip through some of this because I'm running out of time very quickly. Um, critical realists feel a dissatisfaction with positivism, positivism because of its regression based quest for regularities. Um, by untying ontology from epistemology, critical realism opens up the possibility of both causal and hermeneutic approaches. You have to explain and explore and elucidate phenomenon across multiple levels. This means you need to understand group level outcomes, the variables involved in making phenomena emerge, but also experience on an individual or dyadic level to capture everything. So that means that you need the big large studies to understand health inequalities, but also smaller qual studies to be able to understand how autistic people are engaging with GPs and vice versa, for example. Um, there is a requirement across multiple disciplines because you need to understand phenomenon on all levels. Um, to be able to do that, you also need to prioritize autistic people's knowledge um, because autistic people live at the heart of being autistic. So that's where the deepest knowledge is. Um, Lastly, we tend to bridge across the fact value divide and critical realism was intended to be transformative. You're meant to make this is how things are, this is how they ought to be statements. 
we know that autistic people face inequalities and we also know that autistic people deserve a better future and should have a better future therefore we can use science as a vehicle for human rights to create that better future that means making active research which makes a difference this is something that supports the idea of community psychology which is actively driven by values and this is probably the last point that i'll make reflexivity is key here all of this violent knowledge generation has been made in the name of things like objectivity right so we defend things like eugenics because of objectivity but actually when you apply a critical realist framework, regardless of whether you're doing experimental work or um, qualitative or quantitative, you have a responsibility to understand how your social and cultural upbringing, and for example, anything like that shapes your ideas in science, um, including how you interpret and discuss your data, um, because you are mediating the relationship between a measurement of reality and reality. Um, and this shapes things like social justice because it is a process that aims to transform and it is something that means that we take individual responsibility and collective responsibility for how we generate knowledge. Um, yes. Thank you very much and I'm sorry I went over and that was a fly through so if you have any more questions, this is my email address um, and my Twitter handle. Thank you, Monique. There are lots of requests for your slides. So if you are happy to uh, for people to contact you directly, please do pop your email address in the in the chat box. Um, Amy, without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Hi, so I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so my talk is probably going to run a little bit shorter, so it'll balance that out quite nicely, because quite a few of the things that I'm going to talk about have been covered in some way by both Krisha and Monique. So this hopefully will wrap quite nicely around both of those. So I'm just going to share my very, uh, not very detailed slides, should I say it with you so that you can see these. Um, so the title of the talk is a little bit of a uh, misleading title in that though I'm going to be talking about social psychology, actually the more important thing to take away from this talk is what Monique said just at last bit of theirs which is that actually in order to have a more thorough understanding of autistic people what we need is a much more interdisciplinary um, perspective taken to understanding autism and autistic people's experiences um, so I'm just gonna move everything so I can see it quite nicely um, here we go so uh, to introduce myself I am Dr Amy Pearson I am a psychologist who works at the University of Sunderland. I'm also an incredibly recently formally diagnosed autistic adult. Um, and this is the first conference talk I've done since uh, that kind of finishing the diagnostic process back in August. Um, so yay, a really nice conference to speak at. So what I wanna focus on today is the lack um, of understanding we've had so far of autistic social experiences through a social lens. Um, and to do that, I just wanted to give a little bit of historical context. So this is, I'm pretty sure, not new information to anyone who is at Park, but I'm just gonna outline this anyway. Um, so our understanding of autism as a kind of a, a diagnostic entity that emerged in the 1940s was provided by Kanner and Asperger, but now we know it's possibly uh, plagiarized from earlier work by Grunia Sukureva. Um, was very much grounded in early 20th century conceptualizations of what normal looked like. So children were very much meant to be seen and not heard, and um, to be polite and social and, you know, kind of exist um, for the pleasure of adults and keep each other occupied when they weren't being perceived by other people. But any child who didn't fit with kind of our conceptions of normality and what normality looked like were classified as abnormal. Um, and it was kind of this boom in psychiatry where we started to take anyone who didn't fit with that kind of uh, standard deviation or normal distribution, and we started to categorize them in different ways. And our early conceptualizations of autism in particular were very much based on Kanner's early work, um, 
which was mostly on male, white children, um, and very much the foundation for the idea of autistic aloneness. So the idea that autistic people could be characterized by a lack of social interest, a lack of interest in other people, um, impairments in social communication, um, and repetitive and restricted behaviors. So more of an interest engaging with their own interests and lack of an interest engaging with other people. And this very early framing has driven all of research, not all research, but the grand majority of research for you know, the past 80, 90 years. Framing autistic people as lacking interest in others socially meant that we haven't bothered to investigate social identity because autistic people aren't social, so why would we need to understand the ways in which autistic people socialize? Oh, there we go. Um, Amy, this just to, to, sorry, Amy, just to jump in, um, it's still on the title slide. I'm not sure if you've moved it along yet, but we're, we're still seeing the title slide. Someone's just flagged that in the chat um, box. I have, oh, um, hang on. Ah, okay. It's fine when I switch slides at a, it froze. <laughs> So, yeah, no, it was it was definitely not deliberate. It's just uh, just my computer. So I haven't got this on full screen, um, which is why there might be some issues in the slide changing. But I'll keep that in mind. So what this has led to is a really dehumanizing way to which we think about autistic people. And I've seen quite a few people mentioning in the chat, actually, during Monique's talk that the lack of social context um, in the way in which we think about autistic people, it, it is something that's really been neglected so far. So autistic sociality kind of bypassed the social sphere and the social context and researchers went straight to what they saw to be the root of social problems um which was cognition so the theories that were built up around autistic social skills things like theory of mind um lack of social affiliation um mind blindness were very much based on the idea that autistic people were somehow lacking in the mechanisms that were needed in order to help us interact with other people. And what this does is, is it completely kind of bypasses that social context in which we exist, in which we grow up and are raised, and it goes straight to what's going on in the brain and what are the mechanisms that control that. So it takes something that is a very kind of embedded process and it breaks that down purely to the mechanisms that underpin that. So what this has led to is research that has framed differences in autistic communication and autistic sociality as something that's situated within the autistic person and particularly within neurological modules. So the idea that, you know, areas of the brain like the temporal parietal junction, which are heavily implicated in theory of mind, whatever theory of mind is, because that would take a whole other talk on itself to outline, um, that it's a particular kind of impairment within that area rather than being seen as an interaction between the person and the outside world. So Damien's work on the double empathy theory was really one of the first, I guess, approaches that looked at autistic interaction as bi-directional. And this lack of the contextualization of social behavior has led to us missing out on important factors, which might explain the kind of the recent social experiences that people have started to focus on in research. So over the past few years, there's been an increase in research into autistic well-being, autistic social lives, things like masking, my own work on victimization. Um, and this means that if we only focus on cognition and social cognition in particular, what we end up doing is missing out on factors that might explain autistic experiences. So in the work that I've been doing on victimization, one of the big things we've been looking at is stigma. And you see a lot of kind of... Um, research on peer victimization, looking at things like whether autistic people can identify when they're being manipulated. And those things, they are important, but if we just kind of frame autistic experiences through the lens of them not being able to identify what's going on with other people, then we end up really not understanding what's going on at all and with more faulty theory. So as Monique was saying, one of the, the major problems we've had so far is that autistic people as a minority neurotype live within kind of a, a culture that's framed by the, the dominant neurotype, which is neurotypical people. Now, I'm not quite sure how to define neurotypicality, um, and it's something that I often question, you know, its existence completely, in that, and this has been a massive issue of psychology, 
when we classify a group of people by a mean or an average, actually none of those individuals necessarily conform to that mean or average. Um, it's like something like average shoe size. If you buy everybody a pair of shoes based on the average shoe size, they're probably not going to fit anybody. Um, but society is framed around the needs of the many and not the few or the minority. And this has meant that our ideas about autism, so our epist uh, well, epistemology um, around autism has been framed through the viewpoint of non-autistic people. And that is slowly starting to change, but it's taking, you know, it's taking its time. Um, and we know that views can evolve, but the ability to control this narrative is not often handed over um, to the minority, which is why autistic people are still framed when, you know, autistic input in research, whether that's as a researcher or as a co-designer or someone taking part in participatory work is often kind of framed through the lens of disruption. So it's seen as autistic people trying to push neurotypical people out of research instead of thinking about how we can work together to reconceptualize some of the faulty ideas we've had so far. Because power knowledge dynamics really control who can create knowledge about what is classified as abnormal. As Monique was saying, we're not seeing as having epistemic authority to discuss being autistic because we have a subjective viewpoint. And we have issues around how we conceptualize autism, if not as a comparator. And again, this is a big problem in social research. So we've got the social model, which looks to frame the challenges that some autistic people have through the lens of society. So society putting up barriers um, or being framed around the needs of neurotypical people. And if we can remove those barriers, um, it might make society more accessible for neurodivergent people. Now, that's not necessarily going to be the case for everything, but maybe for some things, you know, it would make life a little bit easier. But an activist approach takes a more embodied understanding of our experiences. So it looks at intersubjectivity and how our identify uh, identities and the way in which we think are shaped through our interactions with the world. So it looks at that social context as one of the key factors. Um, but it also acknowledges that some things and some aspects of our experience wouldn't necessarily be changed. Um, through improvements in social accessibility. And this links to some of the work that Damien's done around the idea of autism from the inside out. So if we think about kind of the dominant group in society and autistic people as a minority group, um, we're always looking at autistic people in terms of comparison. So how do we classify autism if not in comparison to neurotypical people? How would you define or describe autistic people um, or the experience of being autistic if it wasn't in terms of how we differed to neurotypical people. And in terms of social research, this is really important because obviously the historical context that we've had has framed how we consider autism. So we always think of autistic people as kind of, okay, well, this is a comparison to the neurotypical group and that's been framed through impairment. And it makes it really hard to break away from that impairment focused viewpoint, even when people are looking at positive things. So we've seen this in research that looks at um autistic selflessness researchers finding that in moral decision making tasks autistic people make fairer judgments and that's framed as a problem because autistic people aren't acting in the way that's expected um so even when we're taking really positive features of being autistic it's framed through impairment based lenses um so i um i know i'm running out of time so i'm going to flip quickly onto the next I'll go back to the slide. Okay, so I just wanted to give a little bit of an example of how we might consider this using something like social identity theory. Um, so a lot of the research that has come out on masking over the past few years um, really neglected to examine social context. And there's some recent work coming out looking at social identity theory, um, but it's really been a key factor. You know, autistic people mask, if it's a social strategy, then we have to consider the social context. I don't think it is just a social strategy. I think it's very much based on experience of trauma um, <clears throat> and othering. <clears throat> but we need to consider the social context in order to get a better idea of how these things are underpinned. Um, so social identity theory really examines the way in which we kind of perceive ourselves across a lifespan and how we interact with others. Um, and we know that our identities as humans shift across context. So we allow, um, we manage our impressions 
uh, that we have from other people through the way in which we portray ourselves to those people, um, which Goffman likened to the process of acting. Now, up until fairly recently, there's been very little focus on autistic identity. So though we've had research into things like masking, which is talk about how we manage our identity around other people, we actually didn't have any understanding of what identity looks like on its own to start off with, which makes it really difficult to make claims about, you know, the impacts of masking and what masking is and isn't. And so what I wanted to kind of finish up on is the way in which we can move forward from things like this. And I think what we need to do is take a very ground up approach. So um, I'm not suggesting burning the entire field of psychology down and starting again, though it would help with the replication crisis. Um, but what I do think we need to do is kind of go back to the start and start asking people, um, not necessarily as a comparison, though we can gain information about other groups at the same time, but start asking people about their experiences as a way to start developing more theory. So there's some research that I'm doing at the moment with Kieran Rose, um, John Reese, and Helen Knight. We're looking at autistic identity and monotropism. And some of the questions we're asking people are grounded in trying to relate to social theory. So looking at things like how your identity might change in different contexts. So tell me about who you are at work and who you are at home. Or tell me about times when you could be your authentic self. How does this change over time? And what we're hoping to do with this data is really dig into people's experiences and start building theory about autistic sociality from the ground up. So not necessarily starting as a, you know, kind of a top-down um, social cognition comparator, but really looking at, okay, from a baseline set of information about people's experiences, what are the common threads here and how can we use that to start building up theory around autistic identity and how we understand each other. Um, and I'm going to end there because it's 11 o'clock and I apologize for the slightly non-linear format of that talk. Um, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amy. Damien, if you would like to join us as well, Nikki too. Um, Monique, we'll start with a question for you first, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Gabor. Um, can you clarify how community psychology relates to critical psychology and whether differences are important? They seem to overlap, by the way, exciting presentation. Thank you. So there is a lot of overlap and community psychology um, embodies a lot of critical traditions, including things like um, critical feminism, things like, um, things like, for example, critical race theory, um, things like challenging um, power structure of knowledge, where community psychology is slightly different, um, and this is quite important, is that it's more focused on social action and activism, um, and especially in using that knowledge to generate more rapid social change. And it's also what differentiates it from clinical psychology. Clinical psychologists might focus a lot on things like, for example, the way that you either think about things or, for example, putting out fires. So you arrive at a clinical psychologist when you're already in distress. A critical psychologist might say, well, you're experiencing this distress not because depression is genetic, but because you live in poverty. Um, and you don't necessarily have the resources that you need to have a um, flourishing life. Critical, I'm um, sorry, community psychologists um, tend to arrive and say, okay, what is it that we need to do to get you these resources? You've got this problem. You know that you would have better mental health if you had sustainable housing. Um, so can I help you apply for benefits? What is it about the benefits process? Um, apart from the fact that it's the Tories and really dehumanizing and really hard to get and the boundaries are so low and all these other processes, but how can we streamline it, streamline it, line it in a way that means that it's easier for you to access? What are your experiences with these and how can we change it? Um, so community psychology is meant to be quite active in that regard. Um, but it does rely on things like critical traditions um, to bring that knowledge in, um, but without sacrificing things like causality um, and using big, large scale 
studies, which a lot of critical psychology tends to assume. Um, yeah, I hope that was an accessible explanation. I think uh, some people have echoed that it was. So thank you. And a question uh, follow up for that for both you, both yourself and Amy, actually, that's come up in the chat box. If psychology was burnt to the ground, would its new, new incarnation be a hard science? Amy, I'll come to you first. It's a good question, Richard. Um, I would I would very much hope not. And I think that's been a big issue for us so far. I saw Joe mention this in the chat earlier. Um, but I think one of the, the big issues in psychology, whether we acknowledge it or not, is the fact that we really want to be taken seriously. And I think you could see this in the, the growth of neuroscience and the argument that like, if we can just find out the brain mechanisms that underpin everything, it'll be so important. And that actually tells us bugger all about behavior, knowing which bit of the brain lights up when someone does something. It doesn't really tell us anything aside from what bit of the brain lights up. Um, so I would hope not. I think that is very much what is wrong with psychology, that we have these kind of we take biology and we try and use that as an explanation for people's experiences when most of the time it's not, it's linked to what goes on in the outside world. Um, so yeah, I would, I would very much hope not. Thank you, Monique. To echo that, I think that would be a step backwards. <laughs> like burning psychology into the ground, I'm like, yes, go for it because it rests, it literally rests on a history of um, white supremacy you know, misogyny, transphobia, homophobia, you name the phobia or the bigotry and psychology has fueled it in some way. And we just, we know this. For me, ultimately, any form of psychology is constituting people. And that means either making labels, making explanations, um, or making descriptions of people. And that is always going to be tied to who we are as people. The fact that I'm a community psychologist is very much tied to the fact that I worked with autistic people and their families. I am autistic and I was looking for a method that didn't make me hate my entire field. Community psychology was that um, because it, it's more palatable than, you know, the other stuff that rests on even more epistemic violence. Um, and so because we're constituting people, that's always going to come with some degree of relativity, some degree of mediating other people through our own experiences. And it's also going to come with responsibility, because there is no greater responsibility than labeling or categorizing other people, um, because we are going to use these to develop things like schemas um, and to develop how we think about other people. So the label autism isn't the problem, the fact that we associate <laughs> autism with a lack of empathy, with often violence, with being subhuman, that is the problem. And that's come from how we constitute autistic people. Um, so any degree of constitution of autistic people will never be a hard science. And it shouldn't be um, because it involves a whole bunch of intersubjectivity. Thank you. Nikki or Damien, would you like to come in before I move on to the next question? Oh, you're on mute, Nikki. Nikki. Yeah. yeah, I was just typing, actually, this idea about the revolution. And I was thinking Park's contribution to this revolution, I think, is that autism research needs to be done by autistic researchers in order for it to be funded. And I just think that maybe if that was an agenda that we actually were quite um, activist about, that might be um, quite an interesting angle. Amen. I think with psychology, it's got quite an appalling history in many respects, but uh, um, I think there's always going to be attempts to try and understand brain mechanics and neuroscience. And I think neuroscience will always try and be a hard science, but the most interesting stuff I've seen is interactive and socially situated and takes that into account. Um, and these models and theories are looking a lot less positivist, as it were, than they used to. Um, 
so there's some interesting stuff still there but it's becoming interesting because they're not looking at brains in a bubble anymore <laughs> um basically so um things that what's interesting to me is uh the links with sociology and philosophy in these talks and i mean i'm quite happy with talks about ontology all day <laughs> so, um getting these points across though and why they're issues and problematic because it's highly political when you see the big budget projects and the philosophies and ideologies that are driving them, um, what gets funded and what doesn't and why it's very much a power relationship which we're trying to change Thank you, everyone. Okay, Monique, um, a couple of things for you. So firstly, are you familiar with neurodivergence, Sonia Bowe's work in neurophototherapy? And then another question, um, it's arguable that, that the British Psychological Society have a key role in perpetuating the dominance of the scientific method in psychology research and teaching. How might their dominance over the discipline be challenged? So two questions for you there. Um, so as to the first one, vaguely, um, I've come across it but not enough um and it keeps cropping up for me um and it is actually on my to look at list but my to look at list is also a mile long <laughs> in tiny size eight font so um with regards to the second issue <laughs> so much complicity <laughs> but the bps has also been complicit in a lot of things um and it is a dominant it, it's the same. So if we think of psychology as a power structure, and it is, then we think about the things that uphold that power structure. And the BPS um, has been trying to make psychology a science for a long time because people think that it's more respectable if it is. They think that we can be like biology and that we will somehow command more respect. Um, I think the most important thing is to challenge it as individuals and as a collective. So when they publish things that are completely inaccurate, when they publish things that speak over communities that we belong to, including neurodivergent communities, disabled communities, when they publish stuff that is objectifying to like, for example, being working class, um, things that are reprehensible around things like, for example, race and ethnicity. It's about calling it out. It's only been, um, I think, less than a year since they published a, a, an open letter by a psychologist who was railing against critical <laughs> race theory and saying that, you know, racism didn't really exist anymore. Um, and so taking individual action to a platform um, people and to be like, you should stop platforming people who say effectively crap like this um, and challenge them to represent communities properly, including having representation of those communities on their boards. Um, but I'm also someone that likes a good old fashioned protest. Um, what with being and coming from activist traditions. Um, so I think taking it further and for example saying that well we're not going to send you our registration money um until you address some of these issues is a legitimate action to take to get them to swivel around a bit and make sure that they're representing experiences equitably um i think that answers the question i hope thanks. it does thanks monique damien i'll come to you and then amy i'll come to you if you want to jump in the one area which I think has been quite telling with the BPS is in their psychologist magazine because they have an editor who's been quite uh, good at putting more marginalised voices into the magazine and I led a, a selection of articles around autism and things like this. And yet 
some of the comment pages to some of this material being included or talked about, like critical race theory, by some psychologists out there would make one wince. It's like, ah. And so I think within psychology, it feels a bit of a split field at the moment. So there's some trying to shift it in a more ethical direction. And then there's others who are firmly stuck in the old models, as it were, and don't want to budge. <laughs> so that's my comment on that. Thank you. Amy, okay. there, did you want to come in there? Um, I, I think Monique and Damien have, have covered it really well. So I am, I am a member of the BPS and I'm on one of the BPS committees. And I think one of the major issues actually that we see is, is a lack of joined up thinking. So because there are so many disparate views, mm. not just in regards to autism, but a lot of things, um, those views, for better or worse, are going to be represented in some of the stuff that comes out of the BPS. I think a problem is when there is a lack of inclusion. So there was a recent document came out about working with people with autism and their families um and there were no autistic people included in you know the the board of psychologists that wrote it there were no autistic researchers there and it's not like there's a lack of us um and so i think kind of more working together and you know pushing against it is important um when you have large organizations there's always going to be disagreement um but I think it is important for the BPS if they're going to be taken seriously that they do start getting more on board with, you know, co-production and trying to make sure these are represented. Thank you. Um, I am conscious that everyone would like a comfort break, so let's call it there. Um, Amy and Monique, thank you both so much for your presentations. Um, Monique, there is one last question for you in the Q&A box, if you're happy to get back to that. Um, and everyone, please enjoy a comfort break. We will break until 11.30 um, and then we'll be back for our next presentation. See you shortly. Thank you. There you go, Anne-Marie, over to you. Okay. <clears throat> Hopefully you can see my screen, not yet. Okay. Oh, where's it gone? Sorry, this is a bit awkward. Um, where's so I've got the control panel in the way. Slideshow. Got it. Thank yeah. you. Excellent. Excellent. <coughs> Sorry, I'm hoping I'm not coming down with COVID at the moment, which is a bit of a pain. Um, oh, wait, T, can you hear me now? We, we can, but it's not on um, slideshow mode. It's just on um, presenting mode at the moment. So. OK, brilliant. There we are. OK, well, apologies for that. Um, as you might have guessed, this is my first time to present online. And I'm Anne-Marie from Lincolnshire. Um, what I'm currently involved in is um, sort of activism around um, autism services. Um, and I want to talk about a topic that often comes up in autistic space, and that's how do we secure funding um, to run autism support projects. So here's an overview of the presentation, and why should we apply for grant funding? And I can give you a couple of really good reasons for that. Um, one is that um, as academically inclined autistics, we find the process of grant application potentially easier than other people. I mean, after all, we've got like degrees in answering questions, which is all an application form is. And also, um, if you think about how other autism support groups fund themselves, they're basically getting the money from the beneficiaries and their families. So, for example, if you get your money from subscriptions or conference attendance fees, that's directly from your beneficiaries, or perhaps you're running um, charity stalls, you know, raffles and sponsored walks and that sort of thing, um, most of that money still comes from your beneficiaries and their families. And, of course, hardly any of us are wealthy. 
So grant funding is a way to um, fund your autism support organisation. That means it doesn't compete with um, the sort of the traditional support groups for money. And um, the amounts of money are such that you can um, expand what you're doing rather than just survive. So I'm going to go through what you need in place to apply for funding, where to find out about funders, examples of a couple of funds that are easy to apply for, and how to write a successful application. And I'm going to try not to cough all over you. OK, so um, funders requirements. And this is what donors typically require you to have in order to apply for their funding. The first one is an organisation constitution. Um, now you don't, I will say at this point, you don't have to be a registered charity to apply for an awful lot of funds. Being a registered charity means you can apply for different funds, but these are the basic things you need in place and you can have them in place as a um, as an informal community association, a voluntary association, um, you know, like a group of people who meet up, you know, even a group of people who meet up in the pub or a group of people who go and play um, badminton together, for example. I will have to cough. <coughs> You'll need an organisational bank account with at least two signatories. Um, accounts going back a year, a committee of at least three unrelated people and um, some policies and procedures quite which ones you need depends on the um, the grant which particular grant it is and what I also suggest you do is you get together with your committee and agree on a one paragraph summary of what your organization does and that's just a that's pretty much required for every application form and it's just a way to ensure that you've got agreement as well if you write that together before you start on things, it means that you've got agreement about what your organisation does and where it's heading. And it's also quite useful to have a tagline, a sort of, you know, six words, seven, six words, eight words, ten words underneath your name, describing what you do uh, and perhaps making it distinctive from other organisations. Um, there's a lot of different donors out there and they have different sort of ways of working. Um, small organisations, um, small family trusts are very traditional or can be very traditional and all you do is like having an elderly aunt who's very, very wealthy. Um, you just write a nice letter asking for money and then you say thank you once you've got the money. Um, those can be, they can be enormously, enormously helpful um, and be a lifeline to, um, to charities. Um, you've got larger charities, which can be very, very progressive um, in what they fund. So, for example, they're about they're about empowerment, they're about community building. Um, the National Lottery is a really good starting place for people applying for grant funding. Definitely recommend those. I'll talk about them a bit later. Organisations like the the Rotary can be good, especially if you've got something that is a sort of traditional charity type pity model. So they're good for helping you know, the disabled or disadvantaged children. So, you know, you want to organize a trip to Legoland or something, they're the sort of people who will help you. Um, a new one or relatively new are social prescribing schemes. And those are typically NHS or local council money and social prescribing is um, for people who have mental or physical health difficulties instead of medically prescribing um, they're signposted to a support worker who will match them up with an appropriate um, activity in the community so um, social prescribing and autism are both um, priorities in the NHS long-term plan and that means that there should be money for both of those, and particularly that nice nexus where we are, social prescribing for autism. District um, Council and Community um, funds that they have is another one that might be helpful. And Big Businesses Grant Schemes is the final one on my list. Um, and they can be surprisingly generous um, and quite easy to acquit as well. They don't have really complicated requirements often of how they want the money spending. They're just wanting to you know, basically chuck the money into the communities where they are 
and see that there's some sort of benefit. So where to find out about all this lovely funding? The first one um, I'd encourage you to go to is something called Charity Excellence. And that's a website run by a rather funny Scotsman from his spare bedroom, and he does a fantastic, fantastic job. Um, you do need to sign up just because he's got funding and he has to be able to show who's using it, but everything in that is free. There's no catch. He's not going to try and sell you anything. Um, there's a database, um, a really big database, um, merged database of different fundings um, that you can search. And there's also lots of advice on how to run a how to run an organization, particularly a charity, um, what you need to do to apply for grants. The second one on that list is the one that I use, which is um, a database called Grant Finder, made by a company called iDocs. Um, you might be able to access that by your local authorities, um, community engagement. So that's how I access this one. Certainly don't pay people to help you access grants. I mean, it's it's very easy, you know, all you need to be able to do is use Google and use a very simple um, database tool. So definitely don't pay for it. And this is the one I access for free and it gives me a free um, up weekly update about all the new grants that have opened, which is really cool. Next one down on that list, NCVO, um, National Council for Voluntary Organisations. And they will also offer you free um, access to the IDOX database if you're a small charity. And the final one are community foundations and the different community foundations across, um, across the UK. And they administer, that is they distribute grants on behalf of small, um, small charities, small funders in their area. Um, as well as offering advice. So there's four potential ways to uh, find out about what funding is out there. Um, here's an example of how to get started on grant funding. So this is a corporate um, grant scheme um, and that's great as in sausage rolls. So I was working with a, um, a local autism support group uh, run by parents, they're good. We have, we're lucky we have no division between um, autistic adults and parents where we are. It's just sort of difficult people versus everybody else. So these guys, Greg's, um, gave the support group uh, grants of up to 2,000. Uh, the parents said, well, look, we're absolutely working flat out. So what we really want is just some free stuff. So no problem getting it from Greg's, 2,000 pounds worth of gaming equipment for their um, autistic teenagers group that meets up and does, you know, socializes over gaming. So very easy to access, very easy to equip, and it made a real difference to, um, you know, sort of how attractive their teenagers group was. Another example here is the National Lottery, and the National Lottery's um, Awards for All is grants up to £10,000. And um, these are deliberately made so that they're pretty easy to apply for. So I would, I would advise anybody looking into grant funding to go to the National Lottery. There's slightly different versions of this across the countries of um, the UK. So make sure you're on the right page. And they do have grants for over 10,000, but it's a more complicated, more rigorous process. But this one is deliberately meant for um, small community associations, local charities, things like that, people who are just getting going, and they are quite generous and they do actually help you through the grant process. They're also used to dealing with disabled people and communicating with them in their preferred way. So good all round. It's important to check what the donor allows. Um, generally with grant funding, they won't fund one-off events um, like a festival or a conference. So what you might think of doing is splitting that up into workshops or ongoing monthly sessions and perhaps calling it something other than a festival, calling it something like training capacity building. 
do check the funders timeline because um, you need to make sure that the money is going to be available when you can spend it. And that means working around things like term time, which affects room availability, which affects um, participant and volunteer availability. Um, Check that what you're asking for can be funded, like capital expenditure, things like laptops might be excluded. So with a small grant, they will typically be excluded. Um, so will salaries, but perhaps session facilitators will be allowed instead. And think about whether you can include some of your organization's um, um, uh, overheads. So things like um, public liability insurance and phone bills and stuff. Some, some uh, funders will do this, but typically core running costs aren't allowed. Make sure you do include volunteer costs though, because um, I mean, essentially it's, 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 it's a good way of looking after your volunteers. You know, the idea is that being a volunteer shouldn't cost you any money. So that means reimbursing things like um, travel expenses, which can make a lot of difference to people who aren't particularly wealthy. Um, and the other thing to look out for is whether your council can offer you freebies. So typically they might be offering free DBS checks, um, so that's disclosure and barring for safeguarding purposes, uh, or they might be able to offer you some free training. So how to create a good impression on your application form. So first one, show your organisation successful. So talk about it, talk it up as though it is a successful organisation. I mean, after all, you are delivering stuff. So emphasise that, what you're already doing, how many people you're working with, that it's popular, perhaps that um, you know, you've got more demand that you can cope with at the moment, you've got a waiting list. Um, second one is neurotypicals love photographs. So... Um, I know a lot of us don't like photographs, but if you can, with permission of people, um, you know, have pictures, put them on social media, get a discussion going on social media to show that you're doing stuff, that you're a vibrant organisation. Third one down there is involved beneficiaries in project planning. I mean, obviously, as autistic people, we're sort of beneficiaries ourselves. We're in the target group. Um, but involve the people who are going to be using your service in planning the project. Um, the other one, particularly budgets, make sure you have a good budget. A um, lot of grants are uh, rejected for having a budget that's either overly ambitious about what it's going to achieve, or it just looks massively padded out, or it's just not in enough detail. If you have a unique selling point or a hook for your project or for your group, that's really, really useful for securing funding. Okay, I'm heading towards the end now. So getting the wording right, be positive and talk about solutions rather than problems. Often difficult for us as autistics to focus on potential solutions rather than go, that bit's wrong, that bit's wrong, that bit's wrong. So we need to um, be positive as much as possible. I mean, yes, we're working with a vulnerable group or whatever, but be positive about what we can achieve and what we're doing. Copy the donor's terminology. So quite different from sort of academic essays. Um, if, the, if the donor says vulnerable, your application form should say vulnerable. So that's the wording that they want to see on the application form. So just copy that. It might not be sort of um, sort of super um, academically correct language that you want it for, language, identity language that you prefer to use, but generally copy the words they're using, whether that's disabled, disadvantaged, vulnerable, because that's what they want to see. Um, it's not like writing an academic grant, so avoid jargon and abbreviations and overly fancy language as much as possible, um, because the donors will flick through 100 of these in a day, maybe, and you want yours to be readable. So use active verbs, again, makes it sound positive, makes it sound like it's doing something. Be specific about what you're going to do and get your application proofread by other people, always important to do. And although your first grant 
takes a while to write, much of the text is going to be reusable. So for example, on your website, on the next subsequent application, on media stuff, so yeah. It's um, the amount of work sort of definitely decreases as you write more grants. Um, evidencing the need for your project. So we've got, um, you can get evidence obviously from um, sort of autism research, pure research. We can get evidence from our participants in feedback, in quotes, in surveys. Um, but here are some, um, some of the forms of evidence uh, you can access that are typically available at county level. So your county is going to have, I'm speaking from an English context here, um, an autism strategy. So that's a document about what it aims to do um, for autistic people over the next few years. And that will say what the problems are and it'll give you some numbers. Similarly, your county will have something called a joint strategic needs assessment that may well have a section on autism or it'll have a section on autism under something like learning disabilities. Um, there's um, an autism self-assessment framework at national level that I think had 103 questions in it. So you'll have to play a bit with spreadsheet, but you can get um, information about your county's performance or um, and compare that to the national average. Um, you've got things like um, government social care returns, telling you how many autistic people um, have high level needs. And then finally is the um, index of multiple deprivation, which is very useful if your, um, your group is based or works in an area that's deprived, because that's something funders um, will be particularly keen to see some of them well. So uh, talking about success, um, particularly I, one of my favorites is collecting participant data at the start. So it's sort of front load all your data collection so that everybody you talk to, you've collected data from already. Everybody you're working with, um, you've got that socio-demographic data. Um, but do make sure you're compliant with data protection legislation. It's not too onerous if you're an informal organization. Obviously just don't go running around sharing everybody's email address and medical conditions. If you're a registered charity, um, then do have a look at the ICO's website and they will also help you through sort of in a quite pragmatic way about what you have to do as a small charity to look after people's um, data and privacy. Um, have a think about um, social and financial sustainability. So that means that what are you going to do when the money finishes? Do, are you building up that social support, that momentum to keep the activity going? And how will it keep going financially without a big um, wadge of money coming in? Um, so yeah, evidence from participants, yeah, quotes, evaluation forms. I like to use sort of Likert scales with um, smiley faces and descriptors, going from strongly agree to strongly disagree. So that's easy for uh, people to understand. Your questions are all in the same format and everybody pretty much can get to grips with uh, very unhappy through to very happy. Um, final one is be clear on the differences between outputs and outcomes. So an output is what you directly um, do. So that output might be a post-diagnostic course in autism. So that would the outputs there would be understanding autism, uh, whereas the outcomes are the um, things that the broader things that result from that, such as an enhanced sense of well-being, um, positive identity as an autistic person, and a sense of community. So I think this is my last slide. Um, so why funding applications fail? So contrary to what funding consultants want you to believe, there isn't a secret way to fill in grant applications. There is no hidden secret about it. Um, the closest thing there is to a secret is to say, read the guidance notes. So every grant will have a set of guidance notes read those before you fill it out, read them after you fill it out, check that you comply to those. 
So make sure you squarely meet the criteria. Um, it's easier to get funding if you squarely meet the criteria rather than trying to squish your project into a funder that doesn't really want to fund you. So yeah, if you're having to sort of do gymnastics to fit it into the criteria, you're unlikely to get funding. Um, grant forms are like university essays. So you just answer the question you're asked, don't answer what you'd like to be asked and don't tell them your life story. Just answer the question. Be specific about what activities you'll carry out as a result of getting the funding. Um, have a realistically costed budget. And the final one, um, which sounds really obvious, is make sure you submit your application with all the supporting documents before the deadline. Um, very easy to get caught out, especially when you're working um, with a group of people, but you'd be surprised how many people try to submit grant forms after the deadline. And the answer, unfortunately, is no. OK, um, so that's my contact details. Um, I'm going to be nipping off for the next couple of days, but please do feel free to get in touch with me either by email or on Twitter um, if you have any questions about what I've been saying. OK. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Um, we will be with you again shortly for Q&A. Um, after our next presentation. Um, so I'd like to invite um, Jill Plukalik uh, to join us. Um, hi there, Jill. Nice to see you. And, Good morning, um, everyone. There you go. And so we'll hand over to you, Jill, and then um, Amory will be back for Q&A shortly. Thanks. Yeah. I'll just get my slides up, if that's OK. Um, firstly, thanks to Anne-Marie for super practical uh, paper. Hang on, my slideshow's just coming. Uh, my paper's slightly more theoretical. Um, I'm just going to make sure I've got the chat and my face out of the way, because that helps. Um, I've only got a few slides for you today. Um, and that's mainly because I don't think I particularly need slides other than it's too scary not to have slides. <laughs> um, and I couldn't bear the thought of just looking at my face. Um, it's a written paper um, because that helps me stay on track and keep on topic. So I'll start the paper now. This paper tells the story of Max Goodwin and his siblings, Ruby and Joe, who are all autistic young people. Max at the time was in year one of a mainstream primary school. They and their family, including their mum Kate, took part in my doctoral research project between 2013 and 2015. The story I tell here and its analysis are a contribution to the ongoing development of critical autism studies with particular attention to childhood and education in a UK context. My work in general sits somewhere within critical disability studies, disabled children's childhood studies and critical autism studies. Disciplinary niches aside, I say this to give context to the paper and my positioning um, in relation to autistic childhoods, particularly in education, where so often these childhoods are pathologized and marginalized. This paper instead takes a critical turn towards the way autism, childhood and disability are conceptualized to challenge such oppress oppressive discourses. Aravellas in, in 2000 pointedly notes that where attention is being afforded to marginalized bodies through race, gender and sexuality, dis disabled bodies have been omitted by and through the historical educational agenda of separating out disabled learners. It seems as Aravellas makes the case that even for critical pedagogy, disability is, and this is a quote, the boundary condition that resides just on the other side of hope, the condition that one must escape rather than improve. I start now with the story of Max and his experience of education. This story is shared by his mum, Kate, and is interwoven with stories of his other siblings' experiences of education. Here's his story. We talk about the fact that Max is very well liked. He's likeable. He wants relationships, but he frustrates the school as they, he, as he said, as they say he is, quote, uncooperative. Recently, Max had been reprimanded, reprimanded for refusing to take part in a classroom activity. The activity had been to write a letter to his mum, telling her some facts about Neil Armstrong. Kate had thought about this afterwards 
and unpicked it after talking to Max about why he wouldn't write the letter. Kate metaphorically crouches down to try and consider the lack of purpose of the tax from Max's point of view. And with him, they came to these conclusions. Max's conclusion, conclusion one, why would he write his mum a letter when he could just go home and tell her at the end of the day? Conclusion two, his mum already knows about Neil Armstrong. Conclusion three, his understanding of a new fact was information that other people didn't know. He didn't know anything about Neil Armstrong that other people didn't already know. Perhaps if the teacher had shared the goal, the real purpose of the activity, which we can assume is to demonstrate understanding of the information they'd been learning about Neil Armstrong, that wasn't dressed up in pedagogic creativity, then Max could have done the task, Kate says. Kate tells me early on after we first meet that he's not happy in school, a mainstream where he's in year one, that he'll struggle the most of all his five siblings with mainstream secondary, that unlike two of his older siblings, uh, he won't be given a scholarship to a private school based on an exceptional academic profile. Those siblings were often described as quirky, witty and bright. But that more than any of his siblings, he needed the small class sizes that they in a private school were afforded. At parents' evening last night, school had expressed their frustration that, quote, he didn't show them what he was capable of, end quote that they were, quote, well aware of his abilities, but couldn't assess him at those levels because of his lack of cooperation, that he's definitely a mainstream child, end quote. On the rainbow chart, a behavior monitoring tool at school, Max had begun moving his name to the red stripe of the rainbow. Red meant a child had behaved exceptionally badly and that their parents would be called and the child sent home. Kate saw this as Max's means of communicating how bad he felt and how desperately he wanted to go home. The teacher saw this as something to be ignored. If my heart had strings, they'd be pulling for Max at this point. There was an awful lot of outwitting and manipulation going on between Max and school. He'd often be conned into compliance. Can you write three sentences for me? No? Two? No? One? Okay. We only wanted one anyway. This story has the contours of the dis child in education, policy and practice. If dishumanism asks us to consider the aspects of a modernist conception of the human that we seek to desire and resist, and I'm building on Goodley and Brunswick Call here, one of dishumanism's figuration, the dis child in education, asks the same questions of childhood and pedagogy. What of education do we desire for disabled childhoods? What do disabled childhoods produce in education? What do they resist? What do disabled childhoods do to pedagogy? What do they produce and what do they resist? In this story, we learn how ableism and resistance rub up against one another and seemingly come into being almost in the same breath. A linchpin of ableism in neoliberal childhood, that is academic achievement, is a site of this friction. Max's older siblings in achieving highly assessed academic standards have been recognized by the neoliberal school system as both desirable and deserving, and have thus been given access to a schooling context that better meets their needs with smaller class sizes. They are able to shake off their labels as disordered or impaired and instead are greeted with descriptions of a more desirable kind, quirky, witty, and bright. The, more, the small class sizes of their private school are desirable for Kate's imagining of Max's current and future school experiences. He currently struggles the most with the size and busyness of school life and would stand to benefit from smaller, more controlled classroom environments. However, Max does not demonstrate the qualities, that is highly assessed academic achievement, that would grant him such access. In not meeting or resisting those normative ableist standards, Max troubles his educators as, quote, non-compliant. His non-compliant challenges the pedagogic creativity of teaching activities, as can be seen in his understanding, or not, of the Neil Armstrong activity. His means of reasoning in this situation was deemed unacceptable and he needed to be reprimanded. 
I suspect that had one of his older siblings articulated the same rationale for such an understanding of the activity, they would be recognised as challenging in a desirable way, as quirky, a description Kate tells me that has often been assigned to the, assigned to the two eldest children. Max's quirkiness was framed as non-compliant, as he isn't understood as having the same academic capital, high academic achievement, available that would afford him the virtue of being desirably challenging. Instead, Max's experience of schooling is one of being liked, but frustrating, loved, but dismissed. His siblings' achievements in an ableist system hark to narratives of autistic difference that is celebrated as being associated with high IQ and exceptional ability. The desirability of this version of autism that can be read with, that can be read as quote celebrated diversity, and that's from Rogers, is evident in the positioning of Max in relation to his siblings. This celebration of a particular kind is deeply entwined with the school child who is imagined to be both independent and productive in adult life. That is, it is steeped in neoliberal ableism. Joe and Ruby were read as treading a different tension of the dischild continuum, I'd argue. As their labels of autism slipped away, as trumped by their academic capital, they were potentially caught in a new, different bind. Both were subject to a desiring of their quirkiness and their academic achievement that left little room for their being autistic. When autism reared its head, it came with the added weight of expectation. Surely such a bright young man could not find such a trivial issue so difficult. Having to be re-read as autistic disrupted and challenged the flow of Joan Ruby's academic capital at times when their different needs were apparent. Their desirability as gifted neoliberal school child was precarious. They were drawn in and cast out almost simultaneously. They lived in the complex of the discharge. Children in the same family, all autistic, with the same SEND labels, were having very different experiences of school due to that rub of the discharge, what we desire and what we resist in childhood and education. Desirability here is the promise of future economic production, the child becoming an independent adult contributing through their labour. Max inhabits a risky space of resistance, one in which his potential for imagined future dependence through non-compliance with normative educational achievement leaves him open to marginalisation as less desirable than his siblings, I'm building on Aravellas there again. High academic achievement would allow Max capital and access to a school that could better need, meet his needs, arguably a need of his being autistic, his mum would suggest. In thinking about how desirability comes to be and gather weight in education, I now take a step back from the classroom interaction to broader educational discourses, those of policy and partnership. Um, I'll do some image descriptions first. So image description one, I'll read my image description so that I don't make inappropriate comments about these images now. Uh, image one is Michael Gove sitting on a tiny chair in a classroom in front of a group of young children looking confused. Image two is David Cameron at a school classroom table reading a book to a young child. The child has their head resting flat on the table. Image three is George Osborne in a school classroom with an expression of enthusiasm. A young child is sitting next to him with his elbows on the table, propping up his head with his eyes closed. Uh, and for those of you outside of the British context, they're all uh, prominent conservative politicians. Uh, the quote below from Penketh 2014 says, we need to continue to remind educators at all levels that people do not have special educational needs. Their educational needs are made special a result, as a result of the ways in which we conceptualize and organize our education systems. And that's end of the quote. Beginning over a decade ago with the conservative coalition government rhetoric, first espoused by Prime Minister David Cameron, that of broken Britain, led to the then education minister, Michael Gove's policy drive centered around a discourse of an equally broken education system in need of overhaul. Education policy, specifically with disabled children in mind, drove the 2014 SEND Code of Practice coming out of the Children and Families Act. Stephen Ball in 2013 
reminds us of the ever alluring modernist promise of policy as a means of progress from an inadequate present to a bright future. Education policy for disabled children then is perhaps neoliberal ideology writ large. The discourse of participation, voice, collaboration and repara reparation join on Penketh to enact a brighter future for individual children in which the adult autonomous laboring self is actualized is no more, nowhere more apparent than in the SEND code of practice. Disabled children's education becomes special, quote, through identification, quote, of support needs defined in health and inevitably medical terms. Disability and education here become driven not by pedagogy, but pathology. And that's drawing on Penketh again. And in turn, to the service of market production, as can be read, through the varying degrees of desirability in relation to the Goodwin children's status as autistic. The conflation of education with the labour market is a broad concern, but is well exemplified by the continual conflation of education and a child's right to progress to meaningful employment and independence. The recipe of the code of practice discourse makes the right support with a pinch of value participation and a smattering of parental partnership and by the end of the Code of Practices remit at 25, the disabled child will have the means to self-actualize into the economically productive independent adult. Having high aspirations for disabled children has no doubt been lacking in education policy and practice historically, but it's individualized market-driven repackaging certainly errs on the side of disingenuous in the current social, economic and political climate. Max was reminded of this in it being storied as nothing short of very likable, but frustrating and problematic. He resisted the bounds of the desirable school child as his way of being, knowing and learning did not readily meld with the assessment of those educational policy objectives that measure his progress towards adult economic productivity. Ruby and Joe, on the other hand, were for the most part as desirable as school children could be. They could engage in the exchange that educational policy so desires. The being, knowing and learning that meets and exceeds the markers of progress towards the idealized neoliberal adult. Such desirabilities, though mobilized in policy, were experienced through and with the Goodwin's children's everyday lives in schools. Max was left in the untenable bind of the dischild in his classroom and his interactions with staff. And as a result, hated the experience of going to school every day. Ruby and Joe recognized their desirability only too well. They experienced the everyday pressure of it in the pursuit of perfection in their work and the anxiety of maintaining the highest possible marks. Kate would often greet me with stories of the latest scramble of trying to pick one of them up from the depths of their very lived anxieties, having come second in a recent classroom test. So just in conclusion, I don't, I didn't even put a conclusion slide. In conclusion, uh, though the mechanics of this neoliberal desire takes place through educational policy discourse, the materiality, the lived experience of it takes place very much within the bodies and minds of children every day in and out of classrooms. This analysis has explored the ways in which certain autistic embodiments are orientated more or less closely towards being desirable within neoliberal education. It's hoped that this story and its analysis acts, acts as a catalyst for conversations about what it means to be or be known as an autistic child within education in the UK context. Thank you very much. Um, I've got my references at the end. I can pop a link in the chat if anybody would like a copy of them. Okay. Thank you very much, Jill, um, for your presentation. Uh, I'd now like to invite um, Damien and Nikki um, to join us on screen for some questions. Um, we have some lined up in the Q&A box. Um, they, are, they are mainly for Anne-Marie at the moment, but Jill hopefully will have some come through for yours. That's OK. Um, hi, Damien. Hi, Nikki. Um, so um, Anne-Marie, um, if you're ready for questions, that'd be great. Um, our first one is from Joe. Um, can you tell us a bit about the kinds of projects you've managed to get funding for? How successful have your strategies been? Oh, you're just on mute there. 
Okay, beginner's error there. Um, I've generally been quite successful. Um, I started writing, bizarrely, I started writing grant applications as a student. Um, so it's something I've come back to now and again um, through work. I mean, talking to a professional fundraiser, she says that she expects only three, uh, one out of every three applications to be successful. So I reckon that I've been more successful, certainly more successful than that. And um, it, it, is about, it is about having the right fit, but ultimately there is an element of luck about it. Um, if, the, you know, if the funding panel for some reason don't like something like the application, even the best of applications can be rejected. Thank you. Um, would anyone like to come in there? Nikki, I know that you'd previously said about kind of a, we'd, we'd, the, the idea of funding came up earlier and I know that you popped a comment in there about Anne-Marie's research. Yeah, well, it, your presentation, Anne-Marie, was so incredibly practical. And while I was listening to you, I was thinking of two things. One, we haven't really applied ourselves to try and get funding for PARP. And it's something that is, is actually really essential that we, we look at that and so this is useful information but the other thing is our project for adults over 45 and their um, family carers and so on the whole um, ethos of that is to make some practical recommendations and I was just thinking you know we should include a section on on the funding in the way you describe just to make that project really useful and I was just I would just wanted to contact you offline and say can we include that information that you've given us fully acknowledging you because it's just incredibly useful? Yeah, I'm happy, happy to, I mean, or happy to um, rewrite it in a format that's more usable. Or, yeah, definitely up for collaboration. Thank you. But yeah, this, uh, this is one of the things I really like about Park, that we mix the theory and the practice and the practical in this really um, helpful way. So thank you there. That was great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we have um, another question for Oliver. What are the best options for funding organisations which directly challenge local authorities and NHS bodies compliance with the Autism Act? Um, I've been doing such work in my local area as, as an individual and want to try and expand what I've been doing as an organisation. I've been told by everyone I've spoken to that it simply isn't possible because local authorities won't fund that kind of activity because it challenges them. What funding options would an organisation like this have? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I know we've had this issue in Lincolnshire where funding's been given to an organisation and they've then been running sessions that are more sort of legal empowerment and stuff. And the county's got, well, you, you know, don't expect to get funding from us again after this type comment. Um, the more progressive, bigger trusts um, will help you with things like that. And um, I would actually go to academics who are interested in the area. So people like um, Luke Clements that leads. Um, it is difficult to secure funding for that. Um, I can't off the top of my head think of a fund that would do that. Um, but I know that what we're going to be doing in the Lincolnshire Autistic Society is running, um, using some of our reserves. So if you have um, money that is not tied to any particular activities, so if you're, you're just running a raffle or somebody gives you a massive donation, that isn't then tied to any activities. Um, it's called unrestricted funding. And you can then use that to fund things that are difficult to fund. So in our case, we're doing legal workshops on um, getting your child at the EHC plan. So that's what I would do is try to tend to use unrestricted funds that I've got and talk to people who um, talk to academics who will know how to um, tackle the local authority and their um, yes accountability issues around autism. Thank you. Um, Kat asks how do you evidence that the project is sustainable when the funding runs, runs out if the point is not charging the groups using the service is it a case of saying you'll apply for more funding? 
If, um, if you're running something on a short term, you could describe it as a pilot, yeah, in which case, yes, then you'll be applying for more funding. There are some activities that perhaps after people have seen the benefits of them, they, um, they might be able to um, afford to pay for it, but not, you know, not until they've been to it and they've enjoyed it. Um, and you could also do sort of hybrid funding using things like, you know, using a fund to part pay for it and using your reserves to pay for the other half of it, rather than being solely donor funded. Thank you. Kat also popped a comment in the chat box. I think an issue is a lot of autistic led organisations, particularly those starting out, don't have any funds restricted or not. Indeed, indeed. Um, and there are funds, there are funders who are quite happy with that. So um, National Lottery are quite good for new organisations and also sort of post-COVID funding. There's been a whole lot of that and they're talking about new community structures. So they are not looking for organisations with the past. Thank you. Um, another practical question. For a new organisation, when do accounts need to start from? Dates constituted or bank account opening or date any money actually went into the bank account? Um, Really, it's it's when you when you've got the money in the bank account, because um, obviously a lot of very small organisations, if it's a bunch of people meeting down a pub for um, a chat, they aren't going to have a bank account, but they will have started before they've got a constitution and a bank account. So, um, yeah, and they are and they are used they are used to seeing that and actually are supportive of new organisations. Thank you. Um, question for Jill from Suzanne. Um, what are your definitions of a dis child? I'm assuming that means this. Thanks for the tricky question, Suzanne. I would expect no less. Um, it's not, there isn't a dis child. It's not meant to be something empirical. It's not meant to describe a child. I suppose Goodly and Runswick Cole put it out there first as a way to interrogate what we're talking about whenever we're drawn to this idea of talking about disability or childhood. So in disability studies, we've been a bit rubbish at things about children and childhood in general. It's always been kind of quite adult focused, which is ironic when you come from an autism world, which is kind of child obsessed. Um, and then if you think of uh, literature or theorizing around childhood, that tends to be hugely ableist and uh, really exclusive or exclusionary when it comes to disabled children. So what they're doing there is kind of inviting the two into conversation theoretically. And what I've been doing in this work and work since is kind of taking that theoretical idea of what happens when we think about disabled childhoods and thinking about it methodologically as well. Um, so I think that's what some of these stories with families kind of invite us to do. Like we can hear in what's happening for these children, something quite complicated that isn't ever easily untangled if we only talk about disability or if we only talk childhood, or if we only talk about the idea of kind of throwing everything out and starting again. We're always kind of, there is something that draws us back to being able uh, to understand and talk about autistic childhood so what is that what is it that we're drawn towards being able to try and understand what is it of that that we do want to kind of chuck out get rid of and move on from so it's a way of it's a way of interrogating I suppose rather than it being a child in an empirical sense if that makes any sense thank you Damien or Nikki would you like to come in there all good um I, I, th I think um Jill's explained that in the way that I would understand it. And it's actually really quite a complicated concept. And um, I think we have to be incredibly careful all the time about not pathologizing childhood experience. And, you know, I think that's the underlying message for me because all the way that I was listening to Jill's um, presentation, I was thinking about children who have been really damaged in school by the pathologizing nature of the way um, they've been interacted with within the context of school, both by staff and by, the, by peers. And that as a parent, it's this thing about um, 
tacking this label onto the end of every experience that you have with your child saying, well, that's really interesting for an autistic child. That's unusual for an autistic child. I wouldn't expect that because this is an autistic child. And it's this thing about um, attaching somebody's identity to a stereotype is incredibly damaging for the identity of kids growing up. And I sort of, um, I'm a bit ambivalent about the whole diagnostic thing for this reason, because as soon as a child gets a label, a load of expectations come tumbling down upon them. So, you know, I think, I think that's part of it really, isn't it, Jill, in a way? Yeah, I'd like to just draw on something that Cathy said there, though, in the chat. She's saying that a child can be traumatised without a label or oh, yeah, a, if they don't get a diagnosis in time. So I think one of the things thinking it like theoretically with the disc child can be really helpful for is thinking about like, well, if you burn the thing to the ground, what are you left with? Mm -hmm. And what does do things like diagnostic and identification things yeah. in education because of the education structures that we have what do they offer mm. and I mean there's you're not going to get me kind of defending anything to do with educational policy as it is at the moment yeah. but I think the what I quite like about a disability studies take on it is being able to hold those things in tension mm. of saying well actually yeah. nothing's ever as simple as replacing one thing with another Exactly. And I think it's really important to ascertain the views of autistic adults about their experience of their childhood, because say a diagnostic label at seven, a child might grow up with it, very happy with it. At 15 might feel completely different about it because they have adolescence and everything else. And, and then at 21 feel different again. And I think longitudinal studies are incredibly important because identity is a shifting thing across the life course, isn't it, as well? Thank you. There's lots of comments. There's lots of in the chat, so, uh, yeah, Neil's probably pointing this out too, is the uh, labels and interpretations one gets without a diagnosis, mm. which can often be far worse than the impact on one's self-understanding as well. And I have lots of personal experience of that as a late diagnosed person myself. So, being, yeah, someone's just put defiant, rude, disobedient, lazy, stupid, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah. uh, autism is a different framing. And if you only have medical model, deficit model, yeah. Backing empathy type narrative, then it's not going to be doing people much good either. But changing that narrative to something that is uh, better and more understanding and empowering is um, rather difficult when all the structures uh, imposed on us are trying to create mold the perfect neoliberal functioning citizen. I put in the chat earlier a chapter I'd written a few years back about just being autistic is, in a sense, naturally rebellious against the neoliberal ethos and ideal. So we're seen as a burden, a problem, a risk, a something to be managed <laughs> um, from the outset, which uh, makes the autistic identity also a subversive one whether we like it or not uh, so we sometimes don't wish to be subverting a social situation but we just do so by being there so it's just what can we do <laughs> but accept it and it's kind of yeah quite a attention to deal with in terms of especially current education system I would quite happily burn to the ground even quicker than the diagnostic one. Um, but <laughs> it's, you know, what do you replace these with? It's, uh, there's something better than we currently have. Anything. Um, I have a quick kind of question or comment for Anne-Marie uh, around Park, really, because I was looking at setting up our 
mark as a kind of association with a bank account because rather than looking for funding for part, it's quite an unusual ask. Uh, it's more income generating activities. And so um, might not be much, but it can help run events and pay speakers in future, this kind of thing. So, um, and gaining income from publishing books and booklets and this sort of stuff. I'm not sure I'd get into merchandise, but that's another thing. <laughs> but uh, kind of just a simple way of setting something up. And since COVID has struck, all the banks and stuff are just not interested in a community association. It's trying to do it online is just confusing. So, but uh, would you be able to help? Or um, I mean, I have fairly limited um, experience at setting up organizations but yeah I think the thing to do would be to see which type of structure is best for park so whether that's a CIO or something it might be something funny you know or slightly different or even community interest company or something rather than a charity but to look into that I mean certainly things like yeah. um, I mean, constitutions can task force is a community interest company the national autistic task force so might be something similar to that, might be better than an association, but yeah, yeah. To look into it. Yeah, yeah, drop me, drop me an email, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Now we have one question. We'll try and get, we'll actually answer it. it it's a more general question um, and I'll pop it over to all of you. Um, job interviews seem to favour those who speak fluently. They are horrendous for autistics who experience selective mutism. This can subject people to a lifetime of low wages and lack of intellectual stimulation. Um, simulation, sorry. How should we approach the interview? Should we be upfront with the hiring manager about our, our speech issue? Should we openly use notes? What are your thoughts? I'll give you the um, answer which relates to the Equality Act, obviously, in terms of reasonable adjustments for the interview process, et cetera, et cetera, particularly if you're applying to some kind of a public body such as a council or educational establishment, whatever it is. But the big question is, does the Equality Act actually really have teeth? And um, I think there are massive barriers within recruitment, notwithstanding the Equality Act, which um, vary from organisation to organisation. So you can't say this blanket thing of make sure you tell them they definitely won't discriminate, because meanwhile, back in the real world, even organisations that are aware of the Equality Act, you know, may have their unconscious bias and everything else going on in the background. I think there are various organisations looking at autism and employment. For example, Employment Autism is a charity that's just setting up, which is, and their mission is really to empower um, autistic people looking for jobs by, you know, working directly with autistic people, also working with organisations, et cetera, for things sort of rumbling along in the background. And there's also the whole access to work um, me mechanism, which is the government's um, best kept secret. Access to work is designed to help people with job seeking and in work, including through the recruitment process, but it's rarely used poorly understood by the employers very often. And so it's a very, very imperfect world. Certainly if it was somebody applying to be a researcher for one of our projects in CADS, we would put in place all these things, but that's because we are aware and we're not the human resources department. We are academics that know about autism. I can't say definitely South Bank would be absolutely all over this and able to, comply with the Equality Act and give somebody a brilliant experience of interview. I can't say that for sure because a lot of people work at South Bank and not everybody is autism aware, despite of what the Autism Act says about the fact people ought to be. I think I'll stop ranting now because I'm sure other people have got things to say on this subject too. <laughs> uh, um, who would like to jump in next? 
I'm, I'm going to kind of cop out in saying this is something that I and we people around me have really been struggling with in terms of recently uh, our own experiences of interviewing and recruiting of autistic academics and yeah so I'm probably on recording not supposed to talk about these things much but I think academia needs to take a long hard look at itself in terms of like oh why aren't there more autistic academics like mm. you can't bloody get in the place because university structures aren't accessible places for lots and lots of people mm. um, and just to can I just extend that point and say it's not just about recruitment because if you appoint somebody and then don't support them properly, but, that's, yeah, which we that's all know. no use either. And I think it's, it's almost in some senses yeah. disingenuous to if yeah. we've suddenly had these really wonderful recruitment processes and then actually really yeah, inaccessible exactly. institutions. Yeah, it, and it one of the things problems. one of the things that happens in relation to that is somebody can request adjustments at interview. When they get the job that's not communicated to anybody else after they've got the job you can assume it will be and it's not and you just fall down a big hole in between recruitment and putting reasonable adjustments in place in the workplace sorry damien's got his hand up um just we'll need to go for a comfort break because we're going a bit over time uh, uh we were gonna have one half 12 to one um so we can grab a quick bite to eat um just a quick note though that in academia in many ways being a student you have more accommodations and rights and so on these days at least in a lot of universities are doing a better job with students but with staff and being a, an academic it's not not so great um and the pressures on staff members or just making a job getting a job in the first place sustaining it as you say it's uh an enormous toll and monique's uh, article about uh what you're having to deal with reading autism research and how you're written about and navigating this world um and there wasn't many of us there to begin with, you know, and the ones that were were on the fringes of academia. Um, and making a little niches like Park is um, extremely important, but it's come through an awful lot of effort and against an awful lot of barriers on a personal and group level for us all and uh, academia is extremely hierarchical and elitist the entire education system is um to be blunt <laughs> so um uh being a disabled academic is a kind of tension in that narrative right from the outset so yeah. you'll on a uphill battle so where right from the start. I, I put a link in earlier, a, a book, Ableism and Academia, which is free to download from UCL yeah, Press. Yeah, very useful stuff. Yeah, right? it is really good. <laughs> and I'll, I'll also put a link into some open access papers because within CAG we've done quite a lot of research on, on employment in academia. So I'll just stick that link in and open the link and it's completely obvious which, which are the relevant articles within the link. Thank you. OK, let's go to break. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy your comfort break. We'll see you back at 1 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I would now like to welcome Claire Lawrence, who's going to be talking about this shared autism project. Claire, over to you. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for welcoming me to this um, park conference. It's been absolutely fantastic. I really enjoyed myself. So, yeah, I'm, um, I'm Dr. Claire Lawrence. I work at Bishop Ross Test University in Lincoln, which is a very small university where I have the um, pleasure of being the English subject lead for the PGCE. So you can imagine, um, if you like, the day job is in the current educational climate. Um, yeah, not always as positive as it might be, perhaps. But I'm fortunate because my research interest is all in autism um, and I am a participatory autism researcher. 
if I could work out how to move the, there it goes. Okay, so um, I'm looking at autistic identity. And I was very interested in Amy's comment uh, this morning about trying to find an identity for autism that isn't just not neurotypical. Um, so I'm working with autistic people um, when we're trying to, to explore a kind of an identity that isn't medicalized, it's much more a lived experience and something that we can share with the wider world to try and get people to understand autist autistic identity a bit better. So moving away from this kind of medical definitions and more towards um, articulation of what it's actually like to, to live with autism. And I'm, I'm working with um, two groups of people. I'm working entirely with adults. Um, I'm working with autistic adults a great deal, but I'm also working with family members because um, I'm aware I, I am a, a parent of an autistic child myself. And I'm aware that for um, a lot of autistic people who are struggling to be heard for the reasons, again, we heard this morning, um, it is their uh, family members are often their advocates and allies. So I wanted to make sure that I was working with, with the, both parts of the autism community so that we could um, try and get a feeling of autistic identity emerging right across from that. What we're using is shared reading. Now shared reading um, is the reading aloud of quality literature as a vehicle to explore connections. It's got quite a good um, academic history behind it, uh, mostly from Liverpool University. So Josie Billington there has been using shared reading in various contexts now for quite a long time, good 10 years. Uh, the idea is that it's research um, where reading aloud a quality literature allows the sharing of memories, perceptions, expectations and hopes scaffolded by the vehicle of the text. So um, poems, um, bits of short stories, excerpts from novels, sometimes play scripts are used as, as the sort of vehicle for people to explore what it's like to be human. And it's been used in lots of populations. It's been used in the general, just with the general public, um, but then more specifically with people like uh, prison populations, those living with dementia, um, those living with chronic pain, for them to explore their particular um, kind of experience. But it's never before been used in autism context, autism context. And I suspect that is because there is still this uh, myth out there that autistic people are literal thinkers. Um, and that therefore there's going to be a kind of concrete reaction to the literature. So I'm challenging that by the, by the very methodology to try and um, explore a little bit more um, about how autistic people use figurative language, use metaphor, use, um, yeah, quite abstract concepts, I suppose, um, when they're considering what autism may be. I'm going to give you just a tiny snippet of, of the pilot I've been doing, because I think that's the, the clearest way of, of kind of explaining what we're doing. So I was using um, the poem, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud by William Wordsworth. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and a dancing in the breeze. Now, the first challenge, um, both with the parents group, who were many of them were also autistic. So they were parents of autistic children, many of whom also identified as autistic. And then I've also had a second group who are entirely autistic people, although some of them are parents. Clearly, there's a, a big overlap on that. Um, the first challenge with both groups was to overcome the initial hostility towards poetry, um, which I think, I suspect, is a hangover from the way uh, poetry was taught at school and where they understood poetry at school, which clearly matters to me as somebody who's training English teachers for the future. Um, there was quite a lot of hostility about poets don't use words correctly, they don't say what they mean, there are all these hidden meanings, and there was a kind of, I had to, to wait a bit for people to kind of vent a little bit of that frustration before we kind of calmed down and were able to actually look at the poem. Um, what happened then was people started to, to say, what the poem meant to them. And the first comment was from somebody who said that she loves daffodils because I love red and green together. And I thought that was absolutely fascinating, actually, as a kind of a, a schema and as a perception of sensory difference. Because uh, when I think of daffodils, I don't think of red and green. Um, she clearly did. And I thought that was, yeah, quite an interesting place to start from. 
We then um, had quite a long conversation because one of the parents, um, who is autistic himself, said that the daffodils dancing in that description made him think of the way his son walks on tiptoes and flaps to relax. And they talked about how it's, it's such a natural and positive um, description of something, whether it's the daffodils dancing or his son and then the other people joined in saying, yes, there is this, you know, a kind of a celebration, um, which is there often in autistic children who are allowed to. And then they talked about how school will tend to go for the you know, quiet hands. Don't flap, don't look different, don't walk on tiptoes and, and almost kind of drum that out of the child. But they, they felt it was there. It was it was innate in a kind of a, a dancing enthusiasm. Um, they talked a lot about um, how the daffodils in Wordsworth poem are all there in a crowd. Um, they said they were like neurotypical people all dancing together, um, with the poet very much on the outside looking at that group. So the poet, the human, is outside looking at this big group of daffodils, flowers, all dancing around together. And the poet isn't part of that group, nor does the poet actually want to be part of that group. And that was another point that came out very strongly that although the poet is gazing from the outside and he doesn't join in, he doesn't want to join in, yet he's still getting a lot of pleasure from watching and being apart, apart. And both groups spoke very strongly about this, about how they, they didn't want to be kind of absorbed into this big group activity, but that doesn't mean they're not getting uh, pleasure and joy from it. So somebody was talking about um, going out at midnight at New Year and standing in the garden knowing that lots of other people are at parties, they don't want to be at a party, but they still enjoy the fireworks and the feeling that people around them are celebrating something and that they are part of it, even though they're not kind of actively there. Um, and there was some discussion about how um, sort of neurotypical understanding of autism could embrace that really, rather than trying to force children or adults to join in, perhaps understanding that you can be a part, a part, um, and still value something is important to learn. And finally, um, the speaker is giving a running commentary of what he's doing, they said in the poem, uh, narrating his life, monologuing. And that was something that um, was almost universal actually across the group so far, that people either internally um, will tend to monologue their, their lives as they go along, um, or will, will take great pleasure in telling other people things. Um, you know, a monologue, not a dialogue, so just a kind of running commentary. And they felt that as a poet, it was okay for Wordsworth to do this, to say, I am wandering lonely as a cloud, look at me, but it isn't acceptable in society. And there was some discussion about why is it okay if you're a poet, but not okay if you're autistic. And finally then, um, there was great uh, a celebration of the experience of something um, that others might not have noticed. So this big field of daffodils, other people might be too busy to notice. And one of the participants said, I was late to a meeting today because I saw a spider shedding its exoskeleton. I noticed that it seemed to have more than eight legs. And then I realized what it was doing. It was still pale and damp. I stayed to watch and take a picture. And here is the picture indeed. And that relative, um, importance of the meeting and the spider um, was celebrated actually by the participants, particularly on um, you know, the neurotypical world often getting it wrong. I'm sure the meeting was very important or may not have been important, but the spider, the, the wonder of seeing that, um, we agreed we had never seen it. Um, I wouldn't even know what to look for. And yet to stand there and to notice something and to watch this spider emerging from its exoskeleton is something wonderful and everybody was, was very excited by it and very pleased by it. So I thought that was, yeah, a very nice example. Um, the discussions are captured for us by a colleague of mine called Amy Quickfall, who um, is very good, as you see, at sort of doing a visual, a visual note taking. And we decided to use this rather than recording because it's, it's less intrusive. And in a way, I think it, it actually records the conversations in it better. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it, it gives a much richer way of, of sharing what's discussed. So we've got here the narrator, narrator is autistic, lonely and wandering, and the daffodils and neurotypical people who are effortless and having fun. Exactly what I was going to say. 
Um, you know, living in a daydream, floating along, he seems really happy, but I worry. Um, autistic enthusiasm, how brilliant to be that excited by the daffodils. But the, the comments, I agree it's still words, but it's words that are kind of being captured within image because one of the things we want to do is, is to move away from just using words. So shared reading uses words because they're written down, but not all autistic people use words. So we're trying to find other ways of capturing this identity that isn't just word centric so that more people um, can be involved in it. One of the ways of doing that is I encourage um, the participants to do their own sketches as they go along. So this is um, from one of the participants, what's it like to be autistic? They started talking about hoarding. Um, it seems to be a fairly universal issue amongst the group that once something is perfect, you can't throw it away. So you then keep it. And they were talking about Lego models and how once you've built them, you, you cannot dismantle them because they're perfect. So just, just leave them and then get another one. Somebody said it was like having your own cinema or sound system in your head, being autistic and being able to kind of tune into that. And I love this one, which is a picture of the daffodils dancing and then the voice of the outside world saying, go get a job, which is, yeah, a nice juxtaposition of those, those two ways of being. This is um, a painting done by one of the participants. It's called The Bliss of Solitude, taken um, from the poem. Um, and then this is, a, I think it's a still from Alice in Wonderland film. And the participant said, the daffodils brought to mind Alice in Wonderland speaking to the strange animated flowers that are animals or musical instruments. They feel alien, but, but recognizable, familiar, but different, close, but out of reach. The poem could be a perfect summing up of an autistic person in a neurotypical world. So as well as the, um, the, the text, what's usually in shared reading is you have two texts and they kind of work together. So you might have, an excerpt from a story and then a poem. But what we've done to kind of adapt that is we have the text and then each week in turn, the participants bring along an artifact of their own, um, which they say represents the experience of autism for them. And that artifact can be anything. It can be an object, it can be an image, film clip, uh, song, anything really. We've had all sorts of different things. And they bring them, and again, they're, they're, they're discussed in the group in the same way the literature is because we're expanding on the idea of reading so that you don't only read texts, you can also read films or read objects. So again, that's a way of trying to pull away a little bit from the obsession with the written word. The discussions as we go along are being captured for us in note form by another colleague, Dr. John Rimmer, um, who is an artist um, who works in digital and multimedia work. I've worked with him before on a, a film called Broken, which um, I've got there. I can put the link in the chat afterwards, which was something where he, he worked with a young autistic adult who uses typing as his primary form of communication. And they worked back and forward trying to capture that young man's experience, um, remembered experience of an instance at school where he had asked, he wanted to, to say to the teacher that his glasses were broken and he couldn't see and he needed to move nearer to the front, but he couldn't make himself heard. He couldn't um, you know, put his hand up. He couldn't get um, that communication. And then as he's zoning out because he can't see and because the lesson's carrying on without him, he starts to play some computer games in his head and he starts to have things spinning and things. Um, we made that, um, well, John of Fopal made that. And then I use that in teacher education when I'm talking about autism to try and get teachers to understand that you can't tell if a pupil is fine just by looking at them. So I tend to go in and do observations in schools, always ask about the autistic pupil and always get told, oh, yes, yes, that person's autistic, but they're fine. And I say, how do you know they're fine? And the answer is they're sitting quietly, they're being compliant. Um, and I'm trying to get them to understand that autism shouldn't be judged on behaviour. The autism is, is there and they need to actually check in with that person better and be more proactive themselves in making sure that that autistic pupil is fine. So we worked on that film together and then I persuaded John to work again on this, this current project um, where he, again, he will take what's going on and he'll try and make it into a, a visual multimedia um, expression that we can share. And what he's working on at the moment is the, uh, the Rubik's Cube. 
So um, the young man here in the Rubik, doing the Rubik's Cube is a participant who uses um, a lot of formalized hand gestures. So he, he doesn't like his hands crossing the central line. So he will, if one hand crosses, the other one will cross. Um, and he, he has trained himself, if you like, not to do this and to mask in public. But I've talked to him quite a lot about it. And he says it gives him a, really, a real feeling of balance and he enjoys doing it. So what appears purposeless to the outside world is clearly purposeful for him. And we're going to be looking at these really quite ritualistic movements when you're solving a Rubik's Cube, um, which he can do in, I think it's under two minutes. So he's, he's moving his hands repetitively. If you take the Rubik's Cube out, it looks like he's just stimming. And then if you put the Rubik's Cube back in again, you realise he's in fact involved in a very purposeful and really quite complex activity. So again, that's something we're, we're using um, probably using teacher education again to try and um, get teachers to stop stopping autistic people from doing things just because they don't understand the purpose. Um, I, I keep telling them there will be a purpose. The autistic child will know the purpose. So stop stopping them um, without understanding what you're stopping. So the, particip the participants work back and forward with John as he, as he makes his film. Um, and also John works back and forward with them so that we're encouraging um, all the participants who want to, to produce some sort of visual 3D, 2D um, artifact or art piece. Um, one of our participants at the moment is very musical and he is going to be writing a song, I believe possibly even featuring bat music because he's been recording bats over um, lockdown. So he's going to incorporate that, I believe. So there hopefully there's going to be some quite rich um, things that grow out of this project and John's there as a kind of advisory artist um, to help people produce what they want to produce and not be kind of stopped by any lim limitations in their artistic ability. So where are we going to take this forward? What plans have we got? Um, first thing is we are going to be holding an exhibition at our teaching and learning conference in the summer. Um, so we're collecting all these different things together. So Amy's sort of um, visual capture of the sessions, some of the artifacts that people have brought in, some of the films made out of that, some of the artwork, um, some of the kind of captured um, quotes. And, and I'm going to be working back and forward between the participants and the two artists and trying to work together so that we've got something which they are happy, um, that it, it kind of expresses autistic identity as far as they understand it. Um, and that's then going to be public facing so people can kind of maybe get an impression of autism that's not a kind of medical model, deficit model. They're just getting an impression um, that's, that's more kind of artistic and creative and more open for discussion. And then hoping to use this methodology because I'm now getting increasingly confident that it does work. Um, and I'm hoping to use it with autistic teachers and autistic trainee teachers. Every year we have a number of uh, our trainees who identify as autistic. And over the years, I've stayed in touch with the ones who've either gone into teaching or sadly have decided not to go into teaching. Um, and I thought it'd be a, a good way of working with that group of people to try and explore school um, from an autistic point of view. So that again, we can have a much better sharing of the school experience, positive and negative, um, which we can use in teacher training. And we can, we can try and um, have, have joined up thinking so that this is autistic adults, this is autistic teachers as well as pupils, and then parents and their, their impression of teachers and pupils, and, and try to, to use it to, to create something that can be shared and help people's understanding um, rather than it, it have, being this model that you have usual teaching and then you have this little bolt on what do we do with the autistic child in the corner, which is clearly totally unacceptable. So we're trying to sort of open that up a bit. And then I'm also going to be looking at whether the actual process of being in the shared reading group is helpful to those people. Um, what's coming out again and again is that people have struggled for a diagnosis, either for themselves or their child, and then there's nothing there. There's, they're just sort of left. The majority of shared reading research has been um, about it being therapeutic and about it being supportive. So I'm, I'm going to be looking to see if people taking part find it that and found it that. Um, and then putting that forward as potentially um, a kind of low cost, high benefit support for parents and or autistic adults 
at the point of diagnosis. Um, so that's um, looking at a bit of this sort of social prescription kind of idea. And then finally, um, I'm going to be looking at how the fact that this methodology works, how that challenges the kind of literal thinking myth, the, the kind of language development myth, myths of autism. That's outside my area of expertise, but I'm hoping to work with some other people who are more expert in that to put together some academic work that, that challenges this still believed notion that autistic children will be very literal and be very concrete and they need very structured, you know, no ambiguity. Whereas actually, I think increasingly I'm aware of the, the richness actually of autistic interpretation of texts, um, autistic language, neologisms, and you know, there, there is a, a, a real strength and positive element to autism and language. And I want to try and explore that and, and put that out there a little bit more. And that's it. Um, any questions, please do let me know. Um, that's my email address. I'm afraid um, I'm going to have to dash off. I'm actually I'm actually teaching at the moment. It doesn't look like it, but I, I've been teaching since one o'clock supposedly. So I've got to run onto campus and pick that up. But um, please do send me through um, any questions and I'll be delighted to answer them. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Claire. There was just one in the there was just one in the Q and A box, but I'll happily forward that to you. Um, well, I'll, I'll grab it now. What's it say? Okay, cool. Um, it says, um, "What decide? Who decides what is quality lit quality literature yeah. and, and, and was work by neurodivergent writers included?" Yeah, for the moment we've gone with um, uh, work that's come out of the um, the actual the shared reading project because that's if you like got a, a lot of clout behind it. Um, I have been looking at quite a lot of autistic literature because you're absolutely right, that's the next, the next thing. So um, a book called um, Loud, Loud Voices, um, typed words, Loud Voices, written entirely by autistic people who don't use speech, their preferred form of communication, they, they type. And there's quite a lot of, of poetry and literature coming out of that. Um, so I, I'm going to try and segue that in when no one's noticing and build on that. Thank you very much there's lots of nice comments coming through in the chat box Actually, as well um, for lovely. you thank thank you so much thank you there. very much indeed thank you take care thank you okay uh, damien would you like to uh, join us on screen um that in, that concludes our sessions for the day our final session is going to be a general discussion on the day um, and to talk about future park events and we have the poll that we're going to put to you um as well um nikki what order would you like to do things in um I think it might be a good idea to do the poll first, because if people have to go, we yep. will not be capturing as much information on the poll. Let's do That's that okay. then. So um, I am going to take you all through um, a series of poll questions and I'm going to launch them on the screen in a minute. Um, some of them will be poll questions and some of them it'd be great to gather your feedback in the chat box. Um, so we get a mixture of quantitative and qualitative um, and this will help us to um, this will help us to um, inform future events. So just a quick statement um, to read for you. And um, we have a set of poll questions. We'd also value your thoughts in the chat box just to set a bit of context. Park is an unfunded collective of volunteers. It started at LSBU and has spread nationally with regional conveners organising events in various locations. Park is attracting international interest. LSBU is not able to organise park face to face events beyond London and other regional conveners are taking this forward. So this is really your chance to kind of like influence how everything works, not just at LSBU with us, um, but beyond. So I'm going to launch our set of poll questions. Please take your time to go through them. We have plenty of time um, and I'm going to be talking you through them um, as we go along. OK, so our first question is, are you able to find out about par various park events easily? So that's our first question. Are you able to find out about various parks event easily? And that is a simple yes or no question. Um, if the answer is no, what would make it easier? And please pop your answer in the chat box. And I'm going to open the chat box so that I can so that I can keep an eye on those um, quote answers that are coming through. Um, our second poll question: Thinking of park conferences at LSBU. How often would you like to see these happen? We've got once a year, twice a year, every three months or more. OK, so please do answer that as you see fit. 
Question number three for the poll. Thinking of park conferences at LSBU, how would you like these delivered? Virtually, in person or hybrid? I'm just going to put a caveat against the hybrid option right now, and that's that we're not particularly set up for hybrid events at the moment okay so please do feel free to answer that but we are not set up for hybrid at the moment but ideally in an ultimate world that is that is what we'd like also like to do thinking of park workshops at lsbu so we have a workshop tomorrow evening how often would you like to see these happen twice a year every three months every other month or more OK, so for those of you that, that are familiar with park workshops, there, there's a range of presentations that go on. It's a, a kind of like an extension of the conference. Um, thinking of park workshops or LSBU, how would you like these delivered virtually, hybrid or in person? I'm going to leave this going, so take your time to answer them. Um, what else would you like to see included um, in park workshops please share your answers in the chat box and be great to see those coming through so it's just a couple of answers that have come up so far um i can't answer question two because it's irrelevant to me in the north with lots of kids in schools we are going to be coming over to those uh, those questions later and um, this is the first event i've come across popped up in eventbrite now i know how about the website would be made easier thank you and uh, being being in Northern Ireland would love something regional. We're going to come back to that soon. So, um, Damien, have you got anything you want to add at this point before I crack on? Do you want to do this poll first? Yeah, then? yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. OK, so thinking about park nationally in terms of your location, would you be interested in seeing more in-person events being organised? So that's, again, that's a yes or no. And I can see that people have, have, are answering those as we go along, that's fine. Would you be prepared to travel to park events if they were held in various parts of the country? Yes, no, and depends on the distance for your answers on that. And I can see that's coming, that last one's coming through is the main one. Um, where are you joining us from today? So just to look, uh, we've got a majority joining us from somewhere else in England outside of London. Um, and quite a lot of people joining us from outside of the UK and Ireland, which is great. If you're joining us from outside of the UK, please share where you're joining us from in the chat box. Um, and I'll leave that going. We've seen some great, we've seen some fantastic locations that people are joining us from, from Malaysia, Australia, all over Europe. So do let us know where you are joining us from. Um, we've, got, we've got Malaysia, Italy, Canada, India, Stratford upon Avon, Romania, Brilliant. Seoul, um, Hungary. Cool. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, question one, more notice of park events would make them easier for me to attend. OK. And question seven is not a question of being prepared, but being unable to travel due to disabilities. Thank you for flagging that up. Um, and our final question. Um, and again, we're going to leave these going for, for a few minutes so that people can take take terms, uh, take their time. Um, has this event been useful and informative to you professionally or personally? And our answers are yes, no, and partially. Um, that's our questions. Um, I'm going to just have a quick check, check in. Uh, practical workshops, how does this support park? Knowledge running alongside practical application, more trauma-informed approach in neurodiversity. Keep those comments coming in. I'm going to leave the chat box open, the, the poll open for a while, and Damien and Nikki, I'll hand over to you. While, but I'm going to leave that up. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, I think what Damien and I were proposing now for the last however long we hang about is just a general sort of informal chat really around what we've been looking at today and principles of park and park practice what park might be able to do in the future really I think is there anything else Damien particularly that you think we should be picking up well there's a number of issues we can discuss moving park forwards um, and uh, just beginning with the talks from today um, and reflecting back on those, and I'd be happy for any of our 
presenters to join in as well um, with these discussions and everyone in the chat and Q and A. Um, but with today's talks, it's been a really well deliberately so a nice mixture of theoretical papers and uh, very practical uh, ideas and support and so on. And drawing the links between these um, is something that I've always wanted to do in my own work. And it's, uh, I think Monique in their talk uh, said it very well about scholarship and activism and how having one without the other kind of um, lessens the impact. And so it can be very difficult line to tread, but being a scholar activist is something I've always tried to do and having very practical research projects that actually help people, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, Monique, you want to add to that? I was going to say it's about, I guess, both advancing the evidence base so that you can do things that are reliable, but creating stuff that makes a difference now and tomorrow. I know that I struggle with that myself. I'm about to embark on a three-year very theoretical um, fellowship. And so I've spent the last probably about six months planning smaller, very applied projects that I can do alongside it, things that look at things like housing, mental health, um, setting up like a good um, base for participatory research in Scotland alongside other people up in Scotland. Things that mean that even if I'm doing all of the applied stuff, or sorry, all of the theoretical stuff, that I never stop doing the things that make a big difference to people today and tomorrow and all of the theoretical things advance it. Um, but when people are struggling with things like housing, it can be very hard to give a crap about things like critical realism. Yeah. Um, and I'm very aware of that. Um, I think yeah. though that we can't do it all as individuals yeah. um, and especially with spiky profiles and things. <laughs> And if you're a good theorist, then we need good theorists. I mean, theory is what I tend to like doing a lot myself. But, and I do try and think, well, how can I put this theorizing good practical use, help people with it? But it's working with colleagues and finding team members, as it were, you can work with well and uh, with similar goals. and complementary uh, skills and whatnot and uh, valuing what we can do well and uh, acknowledging the stuff we're not quite so hot on <laughs> say, I think that being that's okay you know, instead of say. being something to hammer us with within the academic field as it were yeah another thing that Park is really good for because I mean one of the things I really struggle with is um people never guess it but I hate writing I really hate writing um and I suppose it's one of those things where there's thinkers doers writers and it's great if you're all three and when you're not it's good to team up with people who really take joy in doing these things because it makes the process a lot less painful. Um, it, yeah, that's, I think, in terms of things like collaboration, um, things like PARC are obviously the, the way forward um, because you have access to a community of people who all have quite similar values, even if there are like small theoretical meta-theoretical differences mm. between people. Um, there's a lot of goodwill in 
bridging across those to create something of meaning, um, which is one of the reasons that I love so much that comes out of Puck, because it's, yeah, it's a joy to see people coming together and actually making something of meaning. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I just say about Puck, I think it's a very collaborative and very um, courteous space as well. I think people are really respectful in their interactions with each other and, um, you know, really good at listening. And I think that's incredibly important because I think some conferences can feel quite adversarial. And I never get that in Park. You know, like there's not, there's not that shooting somebody down in flames for the quality of their research attitude because yours is better. You know, it's not like that, is it? And I think um, we, don't, we haven't ever sat down and articulated principles, but if we did, I think that would be one of them, that it's, it's absolutely a supportive environment and it's about peer support, researcher development and influencing autism research by autistic researchers doing autism research and so on. And the whole employment thing, all that. And I just wonder whether we're at a point where we should do some kind of a mission statement. I don't know. You know, well, we've we sort have, of broadly said it, haven't we? But do you think we need to make we have it? had sort of statements right yeah, from the yeah. outset about yeah. objectives and aims and I'm just thinking about re we whether can. we should revisit it with funding in mind. That's what I think because we did do it at the very beginning, mm. but I don't know. It's, I mean, it's just... Revisiting those would be good. And uh, they were put in a paper about the development of PARC. Which um, I've posted in the chat, the Tizard um, paper. Yeah. And it's some of those uh, initial objectives back in 2015, one of them was to hold meetings and events. We've done plenty yeah, of those. We've done uh, that, haven't we? <laughs> um, but some of them have been much harder to accomplish, like uh, acquiring funding for projects. Not impossible, but very hard. And uh, um, But having Park has certainly helped in mm. networking and supporting each other, uh, promoting participation as an agenda, mm. um, and being a space where we can be critical of autism research, which mm. isn't so participatory, so mm. we can be courteous and polite, but also mm -hmm. critical. Um, mm. And so, for me, it's, you know, part of the way it's developed has been brilliant. It's mm. kind of how we imagined it, just with less funding. <laughs> yeah, well, with no funding. No. It's one, if it was like a real tangible, like, objective, I would like an objective to say, um, funders of autism research don't fund it if autistic researchers are involved in being paid to do it. And I would, it would be an absolute major revolution if we could influence the agenda to the extent that funders had that in, in their um, criteria for funding projects. And I think we're getting to be quite a critical mass. But we don't really know how many people there are, do we? Because it's not like a membership or anything. You can just join in. We're very inclusive. No, it's a very open network. And yeah. Parker's events of always run with certain principles generally in mind so as you'll notice with the scheduling today that everyone got the same amount of time mm. we didn't have keynotes or mm. special voices above others and mm. it's uh, whether someone's a very experienced researcher or not an academic at all it's about providing space sharing ideas and uh, um, and we all bring something different to mm -hmm. that mix and uh, it's just uh, um, lots of positives about our, um I think some of the issues that are continuing have been brought up in the 
discussions today. So uh, working with non-speaking and learning disabled autistic mm. people in research and practice, um, intersectionality, uh, working with Autism Voice UK and groups such as this and trying to um, not sit back and sort of, oh, I don't know what to do about this problem, but actively involve oneself, engage with different groups and start conversations. And so, um, yeah, there's difficult aspects of what we're trying to achieve, but we are certainly working towards them and doing well on a number of fronts. Um, mm -hmm. And just things like the Spectrum 10K project being halted temporarily for consultation. It's a sign that our voices are cutting through to some degree. How much they're actually being understood is another thing. Mm. But um, it's a start in a way that um, we can't just be rolled over, as it were, and manipulated as I think has been the case in a number of large projects. Mm. Um, and so we're showing a different way of practicing and a different way of doing things. Um, there's an interesting point in the chat, um, well, lots and lots of messages to catch up on. Um, having more time for discussion, really, perhaps less presentation time, although the presentations have been really good, all this kind of stuff. Um, I think one thing I've noticed with the online events is they've been, in to my, in many respects, a better way of people presenting their work than the traditional conference, because you can reach a far broader and wider audience across the world. And traveling around the place to sit and watch presentations all day, in a sense with an online event, you can pick and choose, watch the clips afterwards and choose how to engage. And I think in-person events need to be far more workshop style, mm. activity based, not all verbal and discussing, but although some of that as well, obviously, for people who like that kind of thing. Mm. But um, I think in-person events can be far more interactive and less about presenting and so on. Um, and I think we need to organize not only internationally, but on a local level. Mm -hmm. so many of us are quite isolated in our own local communities. And we need to organise around specific universities and support each other on campus, as it were. So I think we have to think locally on, an on, on the small scale as well as globally and on the big scale. So, um, I think we need to talk about allies as well, the sort of um, how Park um, feels about the whole concept of the involvement of allies. So I'm, I identify as neurodiverse, but not autistic, and have family experience of autism. And so I suppose I would count myself as an ally, but you sort of, how can you be a self-appointed ally? That's problematic. You know, if you anybody could stand up and say they're an ally, can't they? But but are they? You know, the reaction but, people's work gets tells you whether well, they're an true. ally or not. It's yeah. kind of but you know good do researchers you... who work with the community well yeah. are usually quite well respected, although we'll critique them where necessary yeah, as course, you're yeah. well known um, <laughs> oh yeah well that's true yeah and uh, I think their their work is recognized because mm -hmm. of uh, that connection and having work which is meaningful to the community 
so mm. uh, Catherine Crompton's work in yeah. following up double empathy issues, mm. great stuff. And mm. I don't see too many autistic people critiquing her personally or her work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Always generally positive. And mm -hmm. it's to be an ally means properly working with the community and building that interactional mm. expertise, as I mm. want to put it. Um, but you know, that's yeah. an interesting paper, isn't it? What constitutes an ally from the perspective of autistic people? How, you know, what is an ally? And what are the expectations of the park community of people who you might um, identify, might identify themselves as allies? And I think things like that. Are, Jim Sinclair wrote about these issues yeah, a long time. A long time ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Some good stuff already out there. Yeah. Um, we can always look at it again, can't we? Yeah. It's always worth revisiting these. Yeah. It's, a lot of this stuff's already been said. Mm -hmm. What else have we got in the chat? I'm going to be monitoring the chat, Damien. That's probably a useful thing for me to do a little bit. Let's have a look. Somebody talked about an idea about setting up a debate between people with different perspectives, which I think is quite interesting. And um, we... We haven't done that. I mean, I do it sometimes in my teaching, set up people with opposing views to, to um, articulate those views and talk to each other in that way. I don't know, that might work for an event, mightn't it? Um, I think we have to be careful with mm. opposing views and panel debates of that nature. Um, I've been in some very uncomfortable situations yeah. some years yeah. ago. Um, being in an auditorium full of behaviourists against oh, your yeah, point yeah, of view right, yeah. not a great deal of fun. Yeah. Um, and so getting the balance right and having a... It would need to be extremely well chaired mm. and organised. Mm. Um, mm. And I do think that is possible, but I think... Um, different parties in a debate need to enter into them in good faith. Mm. Mm. Well, maybe I there. <laughs> well, I get that. I completely get that. And I, I sort of share your discomfort because what I'm thinking now with Park, when we get all the abstracts and everything, if somebody came along and said, oh, I want to tell you how brilliant ABA is, we just wouldn't have them, would we? And I think that's a perfectly okay position to adopt personally because there is so much opposition to ABA in the autism community but we know that that wouldn't be it wouldn't be in keeping with PARC I mean is it a form of a censorship is it problematic or is that perfectly okay um I'm just looking at comment here um any concerns with social media dictating research my worry is only the loudest voices will be heard, creating a hierarchy within the autistic community itself. Um, I think, although it would not, I think, be intentional, especially for most of us, to create any form of hierarchy, I often work as far as I can against hierarchies and try and destabilise them a bit. But uh, I think they appear anyway, whether one yeah. likes it or not. Um, and certain voices like my own are well listened to now and heard, whilst others without doctorates and so on often aren't. Um, yeah. But it's about helping one another as well and um, at times stepping aside letting other people speak uh, and uh, or creating avenues so those who aren't speaking can be heard in their views and so on. Mm. So it's, uh, I think, being actively aware of problems and being humble and listening to people who know better. So 
on a lot of intersectional issues, I am not the expert. You know, I'm white, male, and made my way up from humble beginnings to a somewhat middle class status and so on. So I have at least privileges now that I wouldn't have had in my youth, even yeah. in comparison to my younger self. So it's uh, these hierarchies appear, whether we like it or not, with the way society is structured. But there's a lovely question about part supporting um, early career researchers and younger researchers and people who are trying to get into research. And the answer to that really is yes, because PARC is just a collective. You don't have to be a member. You don't have to pay a membership fee. You don't have to pay to come to anything. And we, when we, before the pandemic particularly, we were doing a lot of research and development activities. So you'd have a successful autistic researcher who's got some publications behind them and is sort of more established, just talking about their process, how they got there, things like writing for publication, presenting at conferences. And we were doing quite a lot of that pre-pandemic. And, I, and I, think, I think it went down well. I think people found it quite useful. So yes, is the answer. The other thing is we did our research around mentoring and, and we had autistic people mentoring other autistic people. So, you know, there is a bit of a, a precedent for this sort of supportive environment because there is no hierarchy in park so if you're 20 years old and just starting out you know you're possibly doing an undergraduate degree or or if you've been around the block a few times you're just the same in park and we are very committed to supporting each other well, so i've found you know, um often early career researchers at conferences often give the most interesting talk yeah. Because a yeah. lot of well-established researchers are uh, often putting out the same studies you've heard them present ten times before, kind yeah. of thing. And yeah. uh, it's uh, not having a go at established researchers per se, because some do great work and have that experience to bring to discussions and all of that. But I just think having a a really good mixture like today of the talk we've had um different backgrounds different experiences um and it's more about the content of the work that's important and the topics being debated than who it is that's getting the sort of yeah. there about it <laughs> you know it's not about status games it's to me it's about the work and content, the practical impact. And we're very What's committed real. to, you know, when people are not students and not are not employed in universities, that doesn't mean that they're not academic academics. Or if people are employed in universities but not in an academic stroke research role, they're still academics. And so we want to break down these barriers that you have to have a certain cut time type of university contract to be described as an academic, this, that's just not the case. And we're really interested in university based, um, community based research, but also this thing about breaking down barriers to employment and to success in, in doctoral study and everything else. That's well, we've done quite a lot of writing about that and research about that, but that's, I think part can really influence that agenda as well. And I'm particularly interested in the whole of the employment thing, but but not that just fixing it up to the front door and then letting you sink or swim once you get get through the um, front door of, of the academy. I think that's really problematic. So yeah, we I think we've got we've got some very clear principles really that we that influence how how we do things in part, but we also want everybody's ideas, you know just keeping the conversation going. And I, I don't know if we quite cracked how we do that between um, meetings, I don't know. Not really sure. 
so many messages coming through. I know we can't keep up, but, but everybody gets the chat, don't they, Neil? That's the thing. no, they don't know. We don't send the chat out to everyone, but we okay. we do we do record it and we go through it just to just to pick yeah, up those key themes. Um, we look for yeah, common themes. common common themes that pop up. That's it informs it, yeah. future activities. Um, speaking of, um, obviously the event has been recorded. You'll all receive a follow up email um, with a link to the recording. Um, I've also typed um, an email. It's got every all of our speakers all of our speakers have agreed to share their email addresses it's got all of the links that have popped up um including Anne Marie's um funding websites um just to take you through the poll results very quickly I'm oh, going yeah, to share right. those um are you able to find out about various park events um easily um so 77 people completed this and 68 percent said yes 32% said no, so obviously there's a little bit of work that needs to be done there. I'm um, thinking of park conferences at LSBU, how often would you like to see these happen? Uh, most of you put twice a year to every three months, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll take that on board. Um, thinking of park conferences at LSBU, uh, the majority are happy with virtual, so hybrid is, is great in an ideal world, but given that we're not set up for that, it's good to know that virtual is hitting the buttons. Thinking about park workshops, how often would you like to see these happen? We've got twice a year for that, um, at 25%, and then every three months at 53%. So um, I think we're hitting the right marks there. Park workshops, again, majority um, are happy with a virtual offering. Um, thinking about park events nationally, in terms of vacation, would you be interested in seeing more in-person events? 57% said yes, and 43% said no. So quite close yeah. there. Um, so again, that really depends on kind of like people across the country um, looking. Um, would you be prepared to travel to park events if they were held in various parts of the country? A majority of you said depends on the location. Obviously, someone made a really interesting point and valid point that obviously also depends on accessibility and, and being able to. Uh, where are you joining us from today? Uh, majority of you joining us from, from the UK um, and in various places and then outside of the UK and Ireland 15 per 15, uh, 19 percent of you so obviously kind of like um, a few people have dwindled off the call um, but it gives us a good idea of where we are getting guests from um, and overwhelmingly 90 percent of you said you found the day useful and informative either professionally or personally nine percent said partially um, and one person said you didn't so I'm really sorry about that please do let us know what what we didn't get right and um when there's um there will be a link to an evaluation form sent out along with the recording so if you are that person you can pop in what went wrong there but equally um you're all welcome we, we really really value your feedback it does help to inform future events and activity um that's all from the poll i'll hand over to jamie and nikki for closing words and just to thank everyone really it's been a really interesting day again and really enjoyed these online conferences this year and uh, seeing all this great work that's being shared and um, yeah looking forward to the December conference. Yeah and I just echo exactly what Damien says and just make the point that Neil and Damien do an absolutely amazing job to get this off the ground because Neil is an absolute expert in making it work and Damien is the um, driving force behind Park even though we are a collective it is something that wouldn't be as it is without you, Damien, and you're modest, but that is true. Well, so thank you, everybody. It wouldn't be the same without everyone here. All of us. So <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. There wouldn't be any presentations without. <laughs> yeah, brilliant presenters. Just be me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so it's, thank you. Uh, it's nice to build this collective spirit yeah. though and to see all this great work being shared so it's what it's all about yeah so thanks Definitely. everyone <laughs> we will call it there there's lots of lovely comments coming through in the chat box so we'll keep an eye on, on those but as for the recording we'll end that now so thanks everyone thank you